are we live right now? We are live right now. All right, sounds good. All right, so uh, I am here today with uh, Solo Requiem. Um, is there any other name you want to be called other than Sola? Yeah, you just call me Sola. All right, sounds good. Um, he, I first met him uh, basically through debates on Twitter. He was hosting a. Uh, He's basically hosting debates on Twitter and me trying to get into the debate sphere. Um, messaged him, reached out, and basically he got my first debate, even though I did absolute shit in that. Uh, so I'll hand it off to you, Sola, if you just want to introduce yourself more. Yeah, hey, um, thank you again for having me on here. I'm Sola Requiem. You could find me on YouTube or Twitter. But I'm planning on expanding soon and opening up a podcast, so I'll keep people updated then. But yeah, don't be too hard on yourself. You didn't do that bad first debate. <laughs> Dude, I didn't even really know how to do a Lincoln style, Lincoln Douglas style debate. I think I had a intro. My intro I think was strong, but then I had no rebuttal. And then my ending or my ending statement was like two sentences. Yeah, um, I could go on a little bit of a personal story for that. <laughs> but, I mean, if you want to, you're more than welcome to. No, it was, what's it called? I honestly, like, some people I know for debates so are like, oh, so-and-so got owned, but I always found that to be, like, silly and ridiculous because mm -hmm. just because someone does bad defending a particular topic doesn't necessarily mean the topic is bad. I always see it as that person is, needs more time to brush up on their arguments. Like, I don't immediately, you know, throw the baby out the bathwater, give or take, and be like, yeah. yeah, this whole concept is dumb. Because, you know, if it's dumb, like, why is it still relevant today? Why is it still a topic is being brought up? You know what I mean? But... Uh, have you ever had any... What's up? I was going to say, have you had any instances where you uh, feel like you did absolute horseshit in a debate? Oh, 100%. I remember um, one of my first debates, actually, I was just out of my Ben Shapiro phase <laughs> and my brain was very black and white with, okay, there's left and right. And I didn't yeah. do theory or, and, you know, the broader concepts of different ideologies. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, like, oh, I'm going to go up to this person who says he's a communist. I thought these people only, you know, exist in like fairy tales and stuff only for this person to what's it when I was like during a debate completely run circles around me like semantic wordplay word game stuff like that and just like shotgunning a bunch of names of like people i'd never even heard of and honestly i was completely i caved in at that point i was just like had no idea what they were talking about and i felt like you know they were basically speaking different language mm -hmm. so i remember being embarrassed and thinking to myself like fuck it's over i'm so bad at debate i'm never gonna do anything again i'll never recover from this but then I challenged myself. I was like, hey, instead of me, you know, admitting defeat like this, why don't I use this as a learning experience and actually try to move up more and practice and sharpen my arguments? Because at the end of the day, the battle of ideas is nothing more than people with tools and weapons. Mm -hmm. And the ultimate tool and weapon is the mind. So if you're always in echo chambers around people who disagree with you, your, your weapon, let's say, you know, a sword is going to get dull. It's going to get rusty. Or if you don't brush up on it, it's not going to be as sharp or as effective as, you know, what you're used to. So that, unfortunately, was my big Achilles heels. And it wasn't until I started reading more into economic theory and stuff that, and I re-listened to my debate I had this person, I realized a lot of it was just gish galloping and shotgunning. And if I actually had, you know, looked into my opponent's position and knew, like, the basic salts of their ideology, a lot of points I could have easily called them out on, but I just didn't because I didn't know. So, mm -hmm. So yeah, my big issue with my debate was uh, the only type of the only type of style of debate that I actually really knew was bread tube, and so once there's that actual structure in place, it took me so long for me to actually be able to listen in while also taking mental notes. Okay, he talked about this. He talked about this. He talked about this. Um, and so when I first did that debate, I thought I was so ready just to find out that i didn't really know what i was doing and so when you asked me to do this de uh the de debate tournament i i immediately jumped on was like hell yeah plus there's a small little cash prize 
Yeah, one hundred and fifty dollars first place, fifty dollars second place. Uh, so that's the cash prize. You don't have to answer this because I know you have to stay impartial. But do you have an idea on who you think is going to take take it all? Um, I have my opinions and I guess views. But like I said, even if I have a personal view, the debate is being judged by a panel of five people who are pretty moderate and mm-hmm. are able to look at things objectively. So, like example, there's been debates in this tournament. I thought one side clearly won. But it wasn't for my panel members to actually point out like flaws or like my I guess my blind spots to say okay, so so did good here, but you're missing out this portion here and here that contradicts him and, sh- and you know basically shoots him in the foot for his debate, and what's it? That's how I kind of see it. So even if I do have a personal like favorite, then it is what it is. But if you were to ask me, if I was a betting man, I would say on the left bracket it's gonna be Liquid Zulu because. Oh. He is very, he's like one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse for like right wing libertarian. <laughs> so he's very well adapted in his arguments. And people are just lining up saying, like, trying to almost challenge him, being like, I want to debate you on particularly your wheelhouse and field. When I'm like, you know, you guys could debate at neutral ground, but everyone's like, no, I want to debate him on is taxation theft. And I'm sitting okay. here like, you're going to debate is taxation theft with an anarcho capitalist. Like, good luck. <laughs> but. That's on the left side. Right side, I'd say it's going to be pretty close between you and Silver. It's my best bet. Okay. Oh, or Daniel. Because right side is a lot more balanced than left side. So, so how because did... Daniel... What's up? Go ahead, sorry. Oh, it's all good. I was just going to ask, how did you decide who was going to be on which side of the bracket? Um, That's with us in the panel board looking over each account. So, as you know... This tournament consists of 16 individuals, Mm -hmm. and I interviewed every single one for a minimum of 30 minutes so I could get a good grasp of their ideologies, what they believe in, and who would be a good partner to go go against, I guess. Right. And then, yeah, I'd share my opinion. We'd all share our opinions. So it'd be like, okay, I think, let's example, Broji would be very good to go up against Bunk. Again, apologies about that. It's Um, not your fault. Yeah. Or, you know, let's say... I don't know. In hoc pluribus would be good to go against, you know, e pluribus. Mm-hmm. Stuff like that. My entire community knows how upset I am about mm-hmm. that debate. I would not Dude, fucking would let it go. Well. <laughs> and really quick, if you don't mind me going into this, like, again, I apologize before to you. I apologize again. To me, I felt like that was nothing of a lack of unprofessionalism. And it really frustrated me because, like, I said at the beginning of this tournament, if anyone has major pressing life issues going on right now, let mm-hmm. me know. Because I love debates as much as the next guy, but I understand everyone has a life, and I'm not going to like freak out if someone has like personal stuff going on. In your case, you had your wife's pregnancy and the birth of your first child. So I wasn't like hustling you like, hey man, when are you doing your debate? Right. So I straight up off the rip told both you and, you know, Bonk said, hey guys, you know, because of this thing, I'm okay if you guys being one of our last people debating. Like I wasn't going to fret at that. But I still kept updates and tabs on you guys, and then here comes the night of the debate. Mind you, he's pretty prominent in the left, and a lot of, like, my leftist mutuals on Twitter were hyping it up and being like, Bunk is going to sweep, Bunk's going to do this, Bunk's going to do that. And they're, like, basically preaching this guy to be, like, the leftist messiah type thing. (laughs) And coming to the tournament, 8 o'clock, he's not there, and then he bumps in. He's like, yeah, guys, sorry, I forgot about it. And I'm like... I don't understand how you forgot about it when you yourself were super passionate, you know, to get in on this tournament and, like, win. Like, you're, like, saying, like, yeah, this is going to be an easy sweep for me. And I'm, like, I was, like, good. I like that confidence. I'm looking forward to the show you bring, you know? And right. I thought, like, you're going you're gonna to be a pretty good opponent to go against them, too. But... I was so prepared for this, to- for the topic of abortion. Like, I feel like out of every single topic, that is my strong suit. And just to, like we had literally talked about it four days prior uh, about having the debate that well, I don't remember exactly what day it was that we decided, but and just to find out that he was going for a walk. So it's not like he was like actually had a family emergency or anything. It was, yeah, I forgot I'm on a walk right now and I can't debate. Yeah, and that'd be one thing if like you, you know, you said it was a family emergency, like it's like, hey guys, sorry, someone's in a hospital because. Unfortunately, during this bracket, I'm not going to say the person's name, but that's exactly what happened, where 
it was T minus five minutes of their debate, and then they privately texted me and say like their mother's in a hospital now, they're going to have to reschedule. Oh, I didn't boot this guy from the tournament because obviously it's you know That's something huge... out of his control. Exactly. But going out and taking a stroll once I give you heads up throughout the day, the week, the month leading up to this very moment, I was like, I'm not going to like tolerate this because mm -hmm. it's a disrespect not only to the tournament but to your opponent you're going up against, which is you. So. That's what I was like, yeah, don't have any qualms dropping this person, but. So what made you want to start moderating these debates? Um, if you want me to be honest, I have a lot more fun listening to people and their arguments. I've always enjoyed doing that. A great inspiration for me was definitely Oxford Union, because the Oxford Union, you look them up on YouTube, they have hundreds upon hundreds of very formal, very professional debates, majority of them Lincoln Douglas style, which mm -hmm. is hint, hint why I do Lincoln Douglas. And I've always found it to be the most thought provoking and the most balanced one, if you will, where it actually gives someone a fair shot to promote their ideologies or ideas. What I saw a lot on social media, especially going growing up in you know the 2016 anti SJW era, was it went from a bunch of conservatives being like LOL, libtards owned, and it's just like a video of like some dude screaming at like you know a college student and i'm like okay i don't believe this is the best they have the offer and mm -hmm. then you saw a pendulum swing where you know here comes twitch and then you have people like destiny people like you know hassan and then it's complete opposite or vosh where they're just screaming at right wingers they're like ha ha owned you and they shotgunned a thousand words a second so i found myself at this weird cross point i didn't like the anti-SJW era debate style that was mm -hmm. prominent in, among the right-wing circles. But I also didn't like the new bread-wing thing because I felt like it was so semantic and word-driven that you basically lose the original purpose of the debate because you're just mm -hmm. shotgunning. It's a game of, like, who knows the most, like, funny-sounding words type thing where you lose the substance of the original topic of the debate. So I basically was like, hey, I've gotten back on Twitter. I see this function called Twitter spaces and usually it's a crowd of like, you know, people who all have their own lives and their own things. They all have passions. Why not make something a market where there's no one else doing this and hosting it for like the average Joe, basically not for like people who are super into politics, but for the average viewer. Mm -hmm. So I thought, why not even do that and let me double down on this, but make it formal professional to show people it is possible to have constructive and intelligent debate. Because honestly, I felt like, especially in America and Western culture, we've been lacking that recently, where it's nothing more of a who owned who comp um, compilation or, you know, so-and-so got destroyed by so-and-so in this debate. If you look at a debate as a win-lose like that, then you miss the point of debate. Because debate, all it really boils down to is who is presenting the best side of their argument or their case. And that's something I'm just trying to reignite within, you know, my small little community but I'm hoping to grow a lot more in that. Yeah, so that's actually one of the reasons why I actually... So I listen to Destiny quite often, and that's because... So it was after the, his bread dupe phase. Now I feel like when he goes into these debates, he's actually like sticking to the main topic, trying to go point by point rather than shooting off 50 different things at once and hoping that they get so scrambled up in what they were talking about. Um that he ends up winning by semantics uh but i mean i was the exact same way i literally just got out of my ben shapiro phase uh i'm trying to find more like left-wing people to listen to but it i feel like it's kind of difficult because the only ones you really have are destiny vosh and hassan and out of those in my opinion i think destiny is the most like sound one out of them uh do you have any uh other interesting people to listen to or people that you could advise if they're trying to get into the po politics without trying to go extreme one way or the other my best advice to people trying to get into politics is one question everything and what i mean by that is i see people get sucked down a rabbit hole of like having an absolute loyalty to one ideology or one side or the other if you think politics is a big game of my team versus your team, then you're looking at politics wrong. Politics, what it should be, is the pronunciation of what ideas are good compared to what ideas are better, 
if that makes any sense. Yep. So that's an advice to younger people trying to get into politics. And you will save yourself a lot of headache if you try marching forward, being like everyone who doesn't agree with my ideology is my enemy. I feel like you could be a lot more productive. So I know you had mentioned 2016 was kind of when you uh, had started realizing uh, the disparities in debate. Is that kind of when you got into politics as well? I would say because of my family history, I'm first generation American. My family's from Cuba. Politics has always been around me, but I didn't really understand it until I got older and started reading into it. Now, even now, like there's times where there's I still got to brush up on political theory of certain topics, but I would say 2015-ish, 2014-ish is when I actually started to take a deep interest in it and read more into it because I've always been pretty much like a book nerd, so I always enjoy just reading things. Mm -hmm. And it went from me having a love for history and constantly reading like random niche history topics like the Japanese Russo War you know, the Cuban embargoes prior to America's intervention, all these things like that. I enjoy reading history like that. And to me, a lot of it came to similar conclusions that helped shape my worldview, if that, if you may. Um, so I know that I see a lot of uh, Christian-related things, so I'm guessing you are Christian? Yes, I'm a devout Catholic. Okay, and how much do you think that plays into your politics? Bruh. Um, I shape my religion first and my politics second. That's always my life view. If I, my personal philosophy is whatever religion you are, whether that be you know Christianity, Hinduism, Islam, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you should always pro promenade your religion to be first of most important. Because I see religion as your basis and your grounds of justification, while politics is the tools you go about doing it so in a given society and using it. Yeah, so don't get me wrong. My story into religion is nothing, nothing like that. It literally started. I so I grew up Lutheran, and it, uh, it we went to a very traditional church. It had the choir. Um, it didn't have any like rock band. It had an organ, um, and as a kid, uh, it just wasn't any fun for me. And so that's kind of how I fell out of religion. Was um, so my family has really bad addiction problems, and because I wasn't getting any dopamine from church, uh, it that's basically how I lost my belief, was this, it doesn't interest me, it has no value to me. Um, but now that as, as I've gotten older, uh, how I got back into religion, I think is kind of silly, but it ended up working in the long run, was uh, someone had told me at the end of the day, if whenever I die, if there is no God, I lose nothing by believing. If there is a God, I lose everything by not believing. Um, uh, and so that's, Pascal's wager. What was that? That's Pascal's wager, and you premise it by, if I'm wrong, the religious person, I wasted a lifetime. If you are wrong, the atheist, you wasted an eternity. What that's is... That's an argument we hear a lot. So, uh, I'll... I'll ask what Pascal's wager is because I've heard it, but I don't really know what it is. But um, basically through this thinking, eventually I was just kind of like, uh, I started to, because I started to believe a little bit more, it made it so that way then uh, overall, I just, I don't really know how to put my like finger on it, but it was just kind of like, you know, I'm going to start praying. I started to see my mood shift. I started to, feel happier about life um and it, it's been one of those situations where like i'm trying to grow my religion or my faith but it, I, I don't really know where to start definitely start at your church is what i'd say find a sense of community signs a sense of volunteership and helping like something i did throughout my service and i'm actually starting up soon is that i did services and food kitchens and stuff that's supporting, you know, local homeless population and helping people out. And that's something I feel like if a lot of people actually did, because like I said earlier, you have these mega churches and you have a giant disconnect from the people who feel mm -hmm. like it's just, you know, it's like the same to checking off a box. Like, oh, I got to go here every Sunday for an hour and I'm good. That's not what religion is. It's not what Christianity is. It's not a box you check off. It's a way you live of life, if you will. And 
I feel like that's best represented by your works and what you do in your community by helping other tied in with your faith as well, demonstrating to everyone like, hey, I'm a Christian, you know, wear that pr proudly on your chest. <laughs> I completely, I literally had something in my head and literally went out <laughs> the you moment you guys finished talking. Oh, or... no. Oh, so I, I remember what it was now. So it was, um, so right now I'm having a difficult time finding a church because my girlfriend, she grew up Catholic and I grew up Lutheran. So we're trying to find a non denominational church, but it's not like most churches, at least not around where I live, advertise, hey, we're non denominational. Um, so in your opinion, have, so have you only ever gone to Catholic churches or have you like branched out to others? So I originally was Protestant before I was Catholic and I did go to these non-denominational churches. And one of the reasons I coined myself an atheist for a long point in my life was because of how lacking the non-denominational churches were and how much they didn't really, there was no sense of community. It was a hollow husk of a church, if you will. Okay. Um, my recommendation to you is honestly, if you want, do church hopping. Like every other Sunday, go to different churches around your area, see what you like, get a vibe of the community, to people. You know, listen to the pastor or the father or the reverend, whoever's speaking on a stage. And my good advice is that if you're in a church where you're uncomfortable speaking to the head in charge, then maybe that's not the church good for you. Like I routinely go to the church I go to my mass. I routinely speak to um, Father Kane is his name. He's a very intelligent man who's of the cloth. And we have conversations for almost like, you know, an hour or such every other Sunday. Like, he's a very nice guy. And I feel like, like going back to earlier, community is such an essential thing. You should have almost a bond or a kinship to your church and the people in there. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So what is Pascal's Wager? Oh, Pascal's Wager. So... Pascal, um, it's a Pascal's wager is a philosophical argument presented by a 17th, 17th century guy. He's a French mathematician, philosopher, and theologian. His Blaise Pascal, and he posits that human beings wager with their lives that God either exists or does not exist. And he would argue that a rational person person should live as though God exists and seek to believe in God, because if he does not exist. Such a person will only have only a finite loss, such as like, you know, some pleasures, some luxuries. Whereas if God did exist, they stand to receive infinite gain as, you know, the eternity in heaven and avoid infinite losses, which is an eternity in hell. And the original wager was po was set out in Pascal's like posthumous published. It's called Pensis, which is thoughts in French, which is basically just a collection of like a bunch of unpublished notes. He did write that he was going to do more on this, but unfortunately he did pass shortly. Mm. So a lot of atheists, their first, you know, knee-jerk reaction was like, okay, but what is a true religion? And you would spawn ones that has the most accuracy or truth. So let's say you have a religion of me going outside, picking up a rock, and saying this rock is Glitchko Glub. Glitchko Glub is my lord and savior because he's done X, Y, and Z. And I don't have anything to show for that. Compared to if I look at a religion that's thousands of years old, that has tons of theological backing, evidence proof from even sources outside of church, I would find that to be more true than the opposite of me picking up a rock outside. So that's what Pascal's wager is in a sense. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's... and if I lose you in anything, let me know because I know I could tend to ramble sometimes. <laughs> no, it's all good. Uh, for the most part, it's me. Uh, just trying to think up off on the spot, like way different ways to word things. Cause, uh, so I have a really bad habit of, uh, I will think of something in my head and it's just difficult for me to find words for it. Um, so if I, if I, you see me pause or anything, most of the time it's literally just, okay, how do I word this and make it coherent? Um, so something that I really find interesting about, uh, like people like Jesus and whatnot is, um, I recently heard a statistic where there's more st there's more evidence that Jesus Christ was real than uh, Alexander the Great. And obviously that's not saying that Alexander the Great isn't real. It's just saying that there's so much more history behind Jesus that 
people don't take into account when it comes to religion. Exactly. And there was tons of documented reports by the Romans at the time of Jesus's existence and of the events of his life, which I find interesting. And if you ever hear people say, well, you know, okay, Jesus exists, but he's not the Messiah. And they say something along the lines of like other people came about and claimed their Messiah. Fun fact, Jesus has fulfilled over 300 prophecies within the Old Testament. And the statistical probability of these other people coming by to even fulfill one or two is astronomically low. So it's interesting to see people be like, oh, he's not the real deal. I'm like, if he isn't the real deal, how come he fulfilled over 300 prophecies? One. And two, the closest estimate was a guy who's able to fulfill like three. That's, you know, heavily debated and argued. So that's something I always found interesting with Jesus Christ as well. Where did you hear that Jesus filled up? Fulfilled over 300 prophecies. Yeah, um, it's a school of theologians basically who study like the verses of the Bible and of the Old Testament and Hebrew scripture. And they were able to publish an entire sonnet and study showing the data because their whole purpose was that they were trying to answer the claim was he, you know, no different from other quote unquote people claiming to be the Messiah? Mm hmm. And what they found was that it was he astronomically committed and performed all these prophecies and whatnot compared to other. If I could find the study, I'll be more than happy to send you. Please do. I'm taking notes as we go along just of different things to uh, to look up. So, like, you put up the uh, Japanese real war. I want to look into that. St. Peter of Quirinus. Um, I wrote down what Pascal's wager actually is. Uh, <laughs> Just because knowing me, I'm going to end up forgetting within a couple of hours. <laughs> no, you're good. Uh, yeah, St. Thomas Aquinas, he's prominent for one of the biggest Catholic apologetics to ever exist. And he's a guy who coined natural law theory. Okay. But what I liked most about him was that he was really ahead of his time where he would, before he published a work, he would say, I am presenting argument A. What are the strongest arguments that go against my point so I can have an answer for them? So he kind of did, um, I don't know if you ever watched JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. He kind of did a Joseph Joestar where he will say like, and next you're going to say this. And his opponent would say that. And he's like, all right, I got an answer <laughs> for that too. And then everyone would be like shocked and stunned because this was a very new concept, especially in, you know, writing theology. This was seen only, you know, um, philosophy, but it's <laughs> very funny and interesting. All right, so I do not have any more questions regarding faith. So I guess it's about time we actually get into your political views. Ooh, fun, uh, fun. So how would you describe your political views? I would say I'm a paleo-libertarian. What does that mean? So it's paleo-libertarianism is a sub-ideology of libertarianism. Mm hmm that stresses inherent incompatibility between cultural egalitarianism and the concept of liberty, and as well as focus on the inherited culture as means of maintaining order peacefully, not the state. So what makes them unique and different is that sorry, libertarianism is distinguished by a particular opposition to any types of state intervention, especially like foreign and economic. So... We are against forced collectivism and believe strongly in a choice held by an individual as long as it's not infringing upon others. And really to be paleo-libertarian is just to acknowledge the importance of religion as played in con constructing functioning bedrocks for societies. And to like uphold that by leading by peaceful example of such doctrines and not by force or coercion of others. So I like to always say paleo-libertarianism in a nutshell is lead with the tongue, not by the sword. And, like, as an ideology is one which embodies a cultural and economically right-wing and civically libertarian position, with is, like, let no man rule you by force, for all were created as individuals in the image of God. Okay, and so when you say, so one thing that I specifically picked out of there was forced collectivism. Well, does that, so when I think of forced collectivism, obviously I think of, like, taxes and whatnot. Is that kind of what you're getting at, or...? Not even forced collectivism in that sense, really forced collectivism of either the means of production economically or culturally. 
Like, I don't find it morally right to say, excuse me, I don't find it morally right to say, you know, we're going to force you to do these things for the betterment of everyone else. That's a very consequentialist mind frame that I'm against. I'm paleo-libertarianism and myself personally is very strongly against the idea that the ends justify the means. We say, no, it doesn't. You need to pay attention to the steps of how you get there type thing. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see. So, uh, so what I'm getting at is that you believe that religion should basically have a huge impact in the way we run our government. Is that correct? Yes, I should feel like it has an influence. I don't feel like it should be a force. But I am in favor of limiting government a lot more. And the only stake the government should have is in having, you know, I guess a sense of security against outside external forces like that. So I believe, you know, in having a strong military. I believe in having stronger communities, though, as well. Like, the only thing government should be worried about is, like, international state stuff. Compared to, you know, issues of, like, you know, cultural or state stuff, that should be left simply down to communities, if you will. So, a lot of what I'm hearing is kind of, in my view of conservatism, it kind of resembles conservatism. Uh, how would you distinguish the two? Because, so, what I mean by that specifically is, when you say um, limited government uh, should own the means of production... Um, oh no, should not, should not. <laughs> oh, should not own the means. Oh, yeah, that's what I meant. If I can, yeah, I'm not a communist, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, what what's the big difference between your belief and then conservatism? Conservatism is very heavy for separation of church and state to the point where it isolates it. And conservatism as a whole is just a birth of like post enlightenment era philosophy and thought because what was considered right wing for a long time was simply monarchy, but that kind of was killed under capitalism. Mm -hmm. But I would say another thing is conservatism is morally okay with like interventional wars as like simply a principle and ideology, like it's okay for us going into Middle East and things like that, and so on for saying what's it called. Yeah, you can have a secular society, just, you know, do whatever, live and let live, which I'm against that. I feel like it is a government's moral obligation and duty to help promote and, you know, encourage having social or cultural gains within a given community, if you will. But another difference, too, is that economically, conservatism is very Keynesian and school of thought, mainly for like Western thought in America, while um, paleo-libertarian is very Austrian economic based. Quick question that doesn't really go off of your beliefs, but what are conservative, what is a conservative economic plan? It seems like, so I got into politics around 2016. Um, I can go into how I got into politics, but um since then, it's basically just been culture war stuff, so I have never really heard uh, an effective plan from the right in any so in any way to on how they would want the economy. It's just been culture war shit the entire time. Sure, so a conservative plan is, like I said earlier, based in Keynesian economics, and that came about during post-Great Depression, where a Keynesian would claim, you know, the reason why we got out of the depression was because of government intervention in the economy that allowed us to get out. When if you looked at every graph or economic report from an Austrian perspective, we could argue actually government intervention did nothing to prolong it. And not only that, it was a failure in the government, not the free market that caused the collapse of, you know, um, the stock market in 1934, I believe. And I guess you could say a conservative would like I said, go back to Keynesianism, argue that a government or economy should be able to do whatever it wants, but a government should have the ability and authority to step in and quote-unquote, you know, put out the fires or put things in place if things go, you know, to shit. What they're very heavy, I guess you could say. They would argue, like, you know, economic economics fluctuates can be mitigated by economic policy response coordinated between a government and a central bank. We're against, an Austrian is against the notion of a central bank 
because we feel like that de so I delegitimizes a currency at a given time, which is what the central bank did, you know, pre Great Depression. Okay. Damn, not gonna lie, that was a lot for my brain to take, but I think I got it all. <laughs> yeah, no, like I said earlier, if you need me to slow down or repeat things, I'm not offended whatsoever. I know sometimes I could be in my own little bubble. <laughs> oh, I know that whenever uh, Bunk actually joined the Discord and you and him were going back and forth, I had to tune out. I had no idea what the fuck you guys were talking about, like 90% of the time. Yeah, um, it's just like random people and stuff like that. But funny enough, Liquid Zulu was really looking forward to going up against Bunk, and he was going to pay very close attention to your guys' debate because he has a particular bone to pick with the whole bread tuber esque, you know, side of I guess you could say Discord, Twitter, whatever app that's very utilitarian based. Are you able to go into detail about what uh, issues he has with bread tubers? Yeah, so in particular, he finds, like my critique earlier, that it's a lot of circle jerking with who knows the most intellectual jargon and terms, and who could shoot out the most semantic-driven argument the quickest. And he feels like they lose themselves in the weeds, where it's like, cool, you're able to memorize a bunch of philosophical words from hundreds of years ago. What does this mean for your argument? But... Brogdub and not sorry, not Brogdub. <laughs> um, Liquid Zulu is in the same vein as me, except he's an anarchist. I am not. Okay. Where he feels that consequentialism is a very dangerous methodology, and a lot of leftist thought is heavily based in consequentialism, such as utilitarianism, for example, where they paint it like, "Oh, you're against people being happy. Why are you?" And I'm like, "Well, it's not that simple in that." And you're, I feel like, arguing in bad faith and painting it bad if you intellectually believe your ideology is shaped that way. All right, so you're going to have to explain what is utilitarianism. Oh, brother. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so utilitarianism has been the bane of my existence for the past few months on Twitter. So utilitarianism is the belief that whatever produces the most net positive or net, you know, Happiness result is what is good and definitely every time. So here's a good example. They would say if you are really full sitting in a chair or something like that at a restaurant and you see a homeless man on the street, it is a moral obligation and duty for you to give that food to the homeless person because it would make more people happy than just you eating and stuff like that. Or they say if you live on a large plot of land – to increase the quote-unquote net utility of the certain area, which all utility is based on happiness for them, you would have to invite more people on your land and share it, basically. It's a very weird ideology that came from Berthal, where he primarily based it off hedonism calculus, the way called. So the hedonism calculus is basically saying whatever produces the most happiness in a given scenario is always right. And I find that methodology to be very dangerous and very shallow in thinking. So a quick example why my biggest flaw I see in utilitarianism is, like I said earlier, I am against consequentialism. Out ends don't outweigh the means. But utilitarian, excuse my language, does not give a fuck to that. And they're like, yeah, whatever, you know, whatever the end result is, that's what's best. So, so I always present – what's up? I was just going to say, so based off of what I've gotten from your definition, and that's basically what's provided the, or what started the whole uh, participation trophies. Yes, 100%. That is the thing that started participation <laughs> trophies. Uh, so I'm sorry well, for cutting you off. What were you saying? No, you're good. I'm saying my favorite argument against utilitarianism, I call, is the Bob and Sally argument. So you have a woman named Sally, and she is moderately happy at her life. She's not thrilled. She's okay. She's very neutral. She's not sad or happy. She's contempt. And she goes there 9 to 5. She comes home every day. Same thing. Rinse, wash, repeat. Mm -hmm. And then you have Bob. Bob is a professional serial killer. And he does it not because he enjoys it, but because he's absolutely euphoric for it. He can't get enough. He's always itching to get his next kill, and it brings him nothing but absolute pleasure and joy, like to the highest degree 
humans capable of. All dopamine receptors firing. Unfortunately, one night, Sally ended up taking the wrong turn home. She goes in the back of an alley where she meets Bob. Bob does what he does best and starts to kill her. And in this fleeting moment, she's screaming, no, please, I want to live. But it doesn't matter for a utilitarian because Bob is so happy at killing her that his happiness outweighs her moral right to live. Because he's so happy, it is more than her sadness of dying. So utilitarian would argue, like, yeah, you could say this in this situation it is morally acceptable to let Bob do, do what he does best and just kill the girl. Because it's what makes him happy. Which is a very toxic ideology when you look at it in a case-by-case basis that hides behind the guise of, oh, we're just trying to make everyone happy. Which, me personally, I don't feel like overall happiness always equates to what is good for people. Like... No, definitely not. I mean, addiction runs rampant in my family, and if I was anywhere like majority of my family, I'd be addicted to alcohol, addicted to uh, smoking weed, I'd be addicted to porn. Like the uh, even though you get that great like sense of dopamine in the moment, in the long run, it's definitely not what's best. Exactly. Short-term happiness does not lead to long-term success, and that's what annoys me so much, because logically, it is completely okay to have some guy lay in a room all day long, you know, shoot up heroin, and he's absolutely happy and euphoric. And utilitarian be like, well, he's not harming anyone, he's happy, he's just doing his own thing. I'm like, he's slowly killing himself, though. That's not happiness. What I see to be true happiness is something that has long-term success that you could take pride in. And from an Aristotelian point of view, Aristotle would say, pride should only be used sparsely as the ultimate virtue. Because he would say, pride is when you could confidently say, you 100% mastered a certain thing, a skill, an art form. So let's say a carpenter who spent decades perfecting his craft makes the perfect work. Or an artist, a painting, Van Gogh, spends decades tediously painting every small corner and contour of a page. This, to me, is a good example of long-term happiness. Because this, to me, shows hard work, effort, practice, repetition. And I feel like if more people strive to this goal, they could be more happier in the long run compared to the guy who is sitting alone in his room shooting heroin. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, So what would you say to people... Or is that basically just what you would say to people who have the mentality of as long as it doesn't hurt someone, let everyone do what they want? No, for that, I would say agape love, which is the love of Christ, where you watch out for someone as if they were your own flesh and blood and your brother, and you wouldn't let them destroy themselves like that. And one of my more controversial views people get mad at me for, I say, if I am your best friend, I'm going to help you whether you like it or not. And you could absolutely hate me in the end, but that's not going to stop me from loving you from the bottom of my heart and wanting what's best for you. And I've had instances in real life where I had friends hit rock bottom with like alcoholism. Mm -hmm. I had one guy who I considered a very close friend. I took the keys to his car because he was rampantly drinking and he wanted to drive. We ended up getting a fight and we ended up beating the shit out of each other. But the whole time he was mad. But then once he sobered up, I kept telling him like, look, I'm not going to let you do this. I'm not going to let you harm yourself. And... You know, I wasn't going to say, hey, man, live and let live. Have, here's the keys to the car. Go have fun. No, I care about you as a human. I care about you as a brother, and I'm not going to let you harm yourself. And that's just, that's what I would say to any people. Show agape love, um, the love of Christ. I'm going to write that down. Yeah, sorry we keep rotating back to religion. Like I said earlier, oh, religion is okay. all my views. Yeah, if it... I mean, if it has such an impact on your political view, I I would kind of be shocked if it didn't continuously go back to religion. Um, ju- and just because I don't have any more questions about religion doesn't mean we can't go back to that topic at any point. All good. Uh, so one question that I seriously have, just because I saw one tweet in particular, I'll ask the question then. I'll bring up why I thought of it. Uh, who, if, if through this whole free speech process that you've tried to uh, have on Twitter, who's been the most annoying p- 
pain in your side that you're, you're kind of not really upset you gave them a platform, but at the same time, like, kind of wish you didn't give them a platform. And what made Are me think talking? of... Wait, what? Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say... Uh, so what made me think of it was uh, I saw a post regarding Ludwig. I don't remember exactly what the post was, but I just remember I jumped into one of your spaces and you and this other dude were just going off on him. Or about him. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, thank the Lord I never had Ludwig on my stage. And I guess for Ludwig, he's an interesting little character. I personally feel like his brain is fried after decades of doing hard drugs. And he's kind of like a hollowed shell of himself, like in his former glory days, you could say. But a lot, he has the quote unquote, I'm just asking questions guy, where he's not really asking questions. He's just trying to come to his own conclusion and basis and gaslight people. And mm. I personally find it scummy, especially in the realm of debate or a conversation, because I. I feel like if there's really something you want to know, why not just ask it? Why not just be up front instead of like dancing around the weeds and stuff like that? But he was messaging me for months when I started a debate platform thing. And he would say, hey, I want to be on the debate stage. And I was like, all right, sure. What do you want to debate, man? And he's like, and then his topic he wanted to debate was how to kill as many Jews as possible or, what the you fuck? know. And it was absolutely bad shit and saying stuff. And then I told him, like, look, man, I don't feel like this would be an intellectually honest or good conversation to have. And then he immediately jumped the gun. He's like, oh, so you're pro censorship? I'm like, no, I just don't want to host something where it's not even a debate. You saying, how do we properly remove people from society? I don't see being as a debate. And then he tried to parade around and he said, everyone, look, Sol is really not free speech. He didn't want to go on this platform and talk about killing people. I'm like, yeah, of course I'm not going to do that, because that's just stupid. <laughs> like, right, I, like mean, I wouldn't do that for any group of people. And then he tried to shape it as, like, I was quote-unquote owned by, you know, the Jewish cabal, when in reality I'm like, dude, I don't even know who these people are. Like, I'm just a guy who does debates. <laughs> so he's severely anti-Semitic. Gotcha. Oh, yeah. And then he kept saying, he's like, I'm, his favorite, my favorite line from him is, I am not a Nazi, I am a national socialist. <laughs> and then I asked him what a national socialist was, and then he paused. But the absolute cherry on top, once I had enough and I exposed him, I'm like, look, here's the history of politics of what you're talking about. You are either doing this intentionally, maliciously, or uh, pure ignorance. Each way, I feel like you should really read up on what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And then I was irritated because he attacked my faith, and he said, to be Catholic, the only alternative you know, solution of that, or not alternative, the only logical conclusion of Catholicism is fascism. I was absolutely appalled and disgusted by this, especially seeing the history of the church in World War II, where Hitler destroyed our monasteries, killed our like holy women, and literally threw our priests who stood up against them in like um, concentration camps. To me, that was utterly disgusting. And to say like you know fascism equals Catholicism to me is an absolute slap in the face on not only of the Holy Church but on everyone who participates in it. And I got, you could say that's the one time I really lost my cool on someone basically, but followed up. He ended up, he ended up saying like, I'm really going to expose you this time. I'm like, all right, do your best. And his quote unquote exposure was him hosting a space called solar requiem kills Brown babies. What? And then I was just sitting there and, so here's what I did. I knew he wanted to bait me to get in there so he could just mute me and make me look like an idiot. Yeah. So all I did instead was I screenshot his space and I put the dick riding is real. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, from one of my mutuals who was in there, he was sitting in there with like four people for like at least four hours in absolute silence. And randomly, someone in hush whispers would be like, so who's the solar requiem guy? And a lot of them could go, Oh, he's just really bad in for the visual. He's an evil man who kills brown babies. And then they're all like, oh shit, really? And they're just waiting for me to show up. I just never showed up because I'm like, I'm not wasting my time on you. Yeah, but... I don't blame you there. That's yeah. It. So the only person, like, uh, big political person who I can really think to compare him to is Nick Fuentes. I don't know if you know who that is. Um... Oh, I know Nick. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, basically able to 
trying to talk his way out of what he actually believes to make it seem like he is a lot softer than he actually is. Yeah, get Nick Fuentes, add 40 years to that, and remove all charisma whatsoever. Oh, jeez. And then you got Ludwig. That's basically what you got. <laughs> uh, are there any other uh, people who you've just been absolutely unable to uh, give a platform because you think their beliefs are too extreme? Or is Ludwig the only one? Um, I think Ludwig takes the cake. He's the only one. I've had debates I've regretted hosting before, but it's nothing that serious. But what's it called? Yeah, yeah, 100% Ludwig Sully. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so now, these other debates that you regretted hosting, was were they specifically because uh, of the people who debated them, or was it the topics? Um, I would say the people who debated them. So I had a debate a while back with well, I was hosting one of this really prominent person on the left who was coincidentally transgendered me personally I have my own you know I don't really want to go on my own whole LGBT it's all right good I'm on Twitter so, uh, I'm yeah. on Twitch so you can't go on to that anyway yeah you basically get my drift like at the end of the day <laughs> let's just say I don't really give a fuck like that yeah. I know it sounds very harsh but I'm not gonna like try to make someone's life a living hell just because they are a certain way. Like, mm -hmm. I think it's very silly and stupid. But what was I going to say? Yeah, sorry, I'm going off topic. Anyway, this individual is that. I'm like, I had no qualms with it whatsoever. I was more than happy, like I said, to have them on my stage to debate because I feel like everyone should have a fair shot to voice their opinion. The topic was legalization or... It was legalization of all drugs versus decriminalization. And... The opponent was this investigative journalist guy who I think was Mormon. It's a long time ago. And so far, the debate pops off, and the leftist person is just throwing haymaker after haymaker, all these, like, wild accusations. But the Mormon dude was very calm, and then he responded with, like, every other point with, you know, here's statistics, here's data, here's why your belief system is pretty bad. And the leftist person was pretty upset because, like I said, it was their first time doing Lincoln Douglas, mm -hmm. and they're used to blood tube style, and they're basically getting slapped around. And then what ended up happening was I thought, okay, like all the Mormon dude has to do is you know keep on coasting. He won the debate. The very last thing he said was in his closing argument, <laughs> gentlemen in the audience, please look at my opponent. This is a clear sign of um, degeneracy. For being trans and why we shouldn't legalize oh, drugs. Geez. The moment he said that, I went, yep, that's bad. Keep in mind, this was in a room of 40 listeners. Oh, 40. Fuck. Immediately after that, when we went to q and I'm like, look, man, you put this on yourself, but q and A. immediately, none of it was about the debate whatsoever. It was like, dude, what the fuck, man? Like, at the very end, like, there are people coming up to be like, yeah, I was enjoying your argument, but like, what was that last thing? And then he went in... He's like this long tyrant. He's like, oh, they're not real people. And I'm like, what? Oh, my God. But it was just an absolute shit show. And he's probably a person I regret having on my stage if I knew he was like that mm -hmm. or couldn't have the professionalism to separate his personal views from a debate. Then I wouldn't have hosted that. <laughs> have you ever had any incidences other than that where the attacks just got a little too extreme? Um, to me, I've had some. I've had, I think, a total of nine death threats now for doing what I'm doing, and a total of three people trying to dox me in my entire history of doing these debates. Uh, but, what's it called? Yeah, it's usually very cult mentality, like, ideologies or view sets. So, an example would be Russia-Ukraine. I did a debate on that, and I remember the guy who was arguing pro-Ukraine was all... Think about more Ukrainians. They're all good people. And then the person arguing for Russia, who, mind you, had a master's in, um, I think, geopolitical conflict, absolutely crushed him. It was like watching, it was like watching a child fight John Jones in an MMA fight. And I was like, this is bad. And then immediately after, I just see my inboxes flood with NAFO people being like, I can't believe you're hosting this. Pull the plug now. Pull the plug now, Nazi. And I'm like, I'm a Nazi for hosting a spe free speech platform. And 
unfortunately, after that, one of like the most prominent NAFO accounts tried to go on a crusade against me where they tried to find as much personal information as possible. And they went to the point where I can talk about it now because I've recently got out of military, but he tried to dox me in the military and get the FBI and CIA to investigate me oh, because he quote unquote said I was a threat to American democracy. Yes, and, you host a yeah. free speech platform, yet you're a threat to democracy. Yeah, and a bit off topic, I never understand that leftist critique of free speech where they're like, oh, you know, free speech, you're just like a Nazi. Show me any time in history during the Nazi party where they were proudly chanting our pl platform is best known for free speech. Right. It was quite the opposite. They routinely had brown shirts intimidate and beat the shit out of people who went opposing views against them. <laughs> that's, right. Yeah, and that's also an issue I see in modern politics and debate where it's a game of all right, who calls the other person, you know, Nazi first. And it's just very silly, I think. And the moment someone does that, I don't really take them serious anymore. I'm like, all right, sure, whatever. Mm -hmm. So I typically see that coming from the left. How often do you see it where it comes from the right? Uh, I see it coming about in the right recently, but it's in the sense of them realizing how alluring identity politics could be and using it as like a scapegoat. So... A good example would be Candace Owens. When she first started, she I felt like she was a very intellectual woman. But she went on a huge tirade against, you know, identity politics, identity politics, where she would, like, openly preach saying, I think anyone who uses their identity in an argument is, you know, lacking their argument, which I agree with. Mm -hmm. But then she followed it up with, as a black single woman in America, here's why you should believe my argument. And then I thought you're doing exactly what you're preaching against and you're using identity politics. But I don't know, like honestly, I don't see it as much on the right as the left, but I have been seeing it every now and then pop up, if you will. So with Candace Owens specifically, um, do so the reason why I believe she would go go towards those identity politics is because you consistently see on the left where it's I mean, you had Joe Biden just in the last election where he was like, if you don't vote for me, you ain't black. Um, so I, I feel like her kind of using that identity politics uh, would, uh, although it is, a, I agree, it is a shitty thing to do. But I feel like when it comes to her, because of everything you hear on the left, um, I feel like her doing identity politics would be a little bit more fruitful to the conversations i still feel like her i'd have to disagree with you because i feel like her doing identity politics does nothing more but put herself in a box because now when you bring up the name candace owens people are going to think isn't she like you know the black conservative lady and then you're like wow why do you refer to her as that well because every podcast or show she does she can't stop bringing it up like as a black right-wing woman and i find that silly in a sense like if you want to do that that's all for you like I guess any political commentator who likes to pull identity and shit. Me, I just feel like it's very sloppy and undercut, and you should look at things at a more individualistic level, if that makes sense. I understand. Um, but at the same, like, like I was saying, at the same time, uh, in a world where everything seems to be getting more racial, and it seems like, uh, from my perspective, granted, I mainly listen to right-wing platforms, it's uh, a bunch of people on the left trying to say, like, you are this race, you should feel this certain way, whether it be white, black. Uh, I think I recently saw on your Twitter, uh, you had a Destiny's Rare W, where he's talking about how white people are the only people who actually hate themselves. So how would you suggest people get out of this identity politics when it seems to be all that, all that, anything that matters when it comes to politics on the left. I would 100%. You have two solutions here. The first one would be to, if the game is rigged, don't play the game at all. So that would be my first choice. For some people, I'll say like, like my original point, just don't even entertain the idea of identity politics, even if the other side's using it, because the other side's using it as a crutch instead of like something to help them. 
my second solution would be I feel like but going back to earlier, people should more focus within their community or more importantly focus on like themselves and their family history. Like I can't stress this enough how many times I meet people who know nothing about their family history or their origins. They're like, oh, I think I'm from so and so. Like, no, like you should take pride in your family and like what your family does. And just not for, you know, quote unquote winning debates or owning the libs. You should do that for yourself. Have your sense of identity, if you will. Because I feel cultural identity carries you a long way compared to racial identity. And racial identity is what I'm seeing a lot used in politics, which I have a huge critique on. All right. So I. I hope that makes sense. Wait, what? I said, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, I understand it. Um, so something that I recently learned, uh, and that's only because my debate partner was still trying to figure out different topics and it's, it's super difficult because we're both, uh, more right leaning. And so we almost agree on just about everything. And he recently brought up that we, uh, it'd be interesting for him to, or for us to debate about assimilation versus multiculturalism, um, from what it sounds like, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, you're more for that multiculturalism. Mm, that's a tough one. I would say assimilation in when in Rome do as the Romans, but do not forget your culture or your history. So, I guess personal examples, like I said, my family came from Cuba, yada yada, all that shit like that. We proudly say we are American first. Like, I am I would proudly say I'm an American, and I'm glad for that. I feel like the Cuban identity and stuff is purely on a personal level, and I don't really bring that up that much on, like, a political stage unless it's of relevance to what I'm speaking of. So I guess I go into that later if the whole free speech thing. But I would say definitely more assimilation for a given area. But I'm open to the idea of like multiculturalism as well, as long as if it's cohesive, where cultures could get along and agree. Because I don't believe all cultures are inherently the same or inherently equal. And I feel like saying this term, you know, all cultures are equal, does nothing but de devalue and like, you know, solely or dilute the cultures of people. It's like, okay, my culture is equal to a culture of you know, let's say cannibals or a culture of whatever, you know, child marriages, stuff like that. It's like, it's something I very much disagree on that notion. Mm -hmm. That's why I say, can cultures coexist? So example would be, you know, Europe, for example, there's a lot of cultures there that are very vastly different, but they all have key notions they agree on that they could coexist and live amongst each other on. Right. I really like how, uh, the way you worded, uh, do as the Romans do. I definitely was not thinking about when I told them or told my debate partner uh, my position. I literally looked into it for like three, four days thinking, all right, in what way can I give a solid argument to the point where I thought I could win about because he wanted to be on the side of assimilation. And after doing some research, it's uh, I, I find it almost impossible to have actual multiculturalism. Um, mainly because all these different cultures are so different. Uh, and being in America, having all of these different cultures together, uh, it, it would not produce an effective society. Agreed. Um, the topic definitely is an age-old debate, if you will, and it's always fun to gauge the like philosophical lens or political lens of such discussion. But yeah, if you guys want to do that debate, I think that'd be a really productive debate and it'll be fun. So uh, so he wanted me to be on the side of multiculturalism and I'm having... Yep. That's... Wait, what? I said you can have some good arguments for that one, multiculturalism. Well, that's why I said I wouldn't mind platforming it because I could see good arguments on both sides. It's not like a blowout one-side debate, if you will. Okay, maybe I'll look more into it because what I saw was basically... Um, the simulation being like, yeah, in America, we have the melting pot. Everyone kind of comes together. Yes, you may do your own thing in your own house, but when it comes to society as a whole, you're all have the same beliefs. And then multiculturalism being, um, fuck, I can't think of any examples off the top of my head, but I, I hope you understand what I mean. 
Yeah, like Europe, for example, I said earlier, where you have countries that are the size of United States states, yet they all have such vastly unique and different cultures, yet they cohesively get along. More or less get along, of course. I don't know what the French are doing. <laughs> uh, are there any countries that are as big as the United States? In what sense? Like geographic-wise? or so In which sense do you mean? Because I was thinking geographically. Yeah, geographically, Russia, I'd say. They're pretty fucking big. And like, you could say China, I think. I'd have to double-check that one. Okay. Population-wise, China and India beats us. Oh. Yeah. yeah, India for certain. Do they have 1.2 billion people now? I know China and India go back to back for like largest world population. I don't know. I know China's population declined quite a bit when it came to the one child policy to the point where they had to reverse that policy. <laughs> really quick, are you okay if I go on a bit of a tangent? Go right ahead. We're only an I hour had... in. <laughs> I had, oh yeah we're actually flying through I had the um, you could say pleasure of having a pro communist party of China person bust in my space and he kept preaching the gospel of like the glory of you know Xiao Jinping and like how great China is and how the government has done nothing not wrong on Tiananmen Square but anyway what ended up happening was that he said under the glory of communist China, we have reduced the population of homelessness to point zero zero zero. <laughs> and I thought to myself, huh, that's a very absolute number. I'm like, do you mind sharing anything along this topic? He's like, of course. And all the sources like Chinese government, Chinese government sources, I'm like, huh, interesting. China has really, you know, reduced the homelessness population down to zero. And then he's like, oh, take that capitalist. And then I just go, okay, so I just Google independent Chinese journalists, homelessness, and then it's just all these independent journalists that are, have, like, extremely low social credit score there, mm -hmm. which is, like, if you could live your life, and they're basically saying, like, oh, yeah, China solved the homelessness population all right by showing up in the middle of the night in black vans, throwing homeless people into the back of them and deporting them from the country. So I was like, oh, so you're in my space trying to say it like, home, you know, China found a way to give them free housing and stuff. In reality, they just deported their asses and kicked them out of the country. So <laughs> you're right, they really did solve, wink wink, the homelessness population, but it wasn't the method you're portraying it as. I mean, I will I say... That was really funny. <laughs> I, I will say that it, it beat my initial belief. My initial belief was, okay, if they did that, they probably ended up murdering the homeless. So the fact that they transferred them out of country was, I mean, that was kind of a relief in my mind. Oh, I would not be surprised if they murdered a few of them too, but that's just what the journalists are reporting at the moment. But uh, So speaking of China, how do you feel about the whole uh, China and, was it Taiwan uh, issue? All that Taiwan conflict? Yeah. Um. If you want me to be 100% honest with you, I don't have much skin in the game for that. I hear people talk about it, but it's not something I'm super well invested into. Okay. If you're going to ask my opinion, I'd say sure. I think China, China, sorry, Taiwan should have its independence. But like I said, it's not something I'm like heavily read into, unfortunately. Gotcha. It's all good. Um, all right. So I know you've brought up the Russia and Ukraine. What's your position on that? If you want to go into it. Yeah, um, I used to support Ukraine, but recently seeing a lot of their policies where they're excommunicating churches and stuff like that, Oof. and making it required that you have to wear a little band just to go into a worship service and show identification, and this is a government-mandated policy, and it's of the Orthodox Church, I am not for it. That does not mean I'm for Russia, I just simply say I do not want to partake in any side because me personally, I'm like, why should the United States of America give a fuck about a country thousands of miles across the sea when literally NATO is right there? Like, that's to me, should be a NATO problem. That's not our... Mm -hmm. We don't have skin in the game in that, you know? I completely understand. So, would you say you're more of a nationalist than a globalist? Yes. 
Uh, and- I was nationalist. I would believe that uh, cultural national identity is more important than just blindly obedience to a government. So one thing I will say about the Ukraine and Russian uh, war is it kind of puts an emphasis on why the Second Amendment is so important. Um, I mean, imagine if the people of Ukraine would have already been, I mean, as armed as America is. Granted, no country takes the Second Amendment nearly as seriously. And obviously, I understand no other country has the Second Amendment, but no other country takes guns as seriously as America does. Yeah, and for a good reason, too. And I find it very ironic how a lot of Democrat politicians are screeching up and down, you know, we should not have people in the United States have certain firearms in the same breath say we need to donate billions of dollars over to Ukraine to give them firearms. And I'm like, huh, that's interesting. And then they preposate it as we should take guns away from our enemies. I'm like, all right, if you're taking guns away from the civilian populace, what does that make us? Right. Are we your enemy now? <laughs> it's like, yeah. It's like a really interesting way of framing it where I'm like, huh, that's interesting. Not only that, but who do you think is the one who takes the guns away? People with guns. Yeah, no, they could try to fuck around and find out real quick. <laughs> So, uh, do you have? Are you so positive in the Second Amendment because you're in the military, or why do you think you are uh, pro Second Amendment? Family history, purely. I know this is going to sound pretty anecdotal, but my great grandfather was part of the fights that you know he was involved in incidents like Bay of Pigs and stuff, and he was specifically involved in fighting against the Castro regime where at first he allied with Fidel Castro because he thought, okay, this Castro guy is making promises against the Baptista regime, which are crushing the people of Cuba. But then immediately what Castro did was saying, you know, the war is over now. I'm in control. There's no need for you to have your firearms. There's no need for you to have, you know, these military weapons, which the populace was like, okay, that makes sense. Why do I need this if Castro has everything under control? And it just trickled down to the slippery slope till eventually he was saying, there is no need for you to have a pistol. We have the military to protect you. You know, don't you want to live in a peaceful area where no one has guns? And unfortunately, people bought into this. And then one day, overnight, Castro went mask off and he says, we're going to implement, you know, Marxist policies into the country. And he let his military trample anyone who stood in his way. And... Unfortunately, my great grandfather's brother one night was at a bar and he got drunk and then he cursed the Castro regime for all the suffering he brought to the Cuban people. The very next day, the military showed up and they tied his hands with a rope to the back of a Jeep and laid him face first in the gravel. And they drove around town with my great grandfather's brother face first and they did laps of his body. And then once they were done, they gave the body back to the family and then he was dead. Oh, so the yeah, so to me that not only is I find it immoral for a government authority to say I am the arbiter of what is speech, I find it disgusting because there's blood on their hands for words someone says. And there's a really good quote I forgot who said it, but it says, "When you cut out a man's tongue, you prove him not to be a liar. You prove only you fear what he has to say." And that's some quote that really has resonated for a long time, like. Censorship, I don't feel like, is the right answer. Are there bad ideas out there? 100%. I believe that. Are there hateful ideas out there? 100%. I believe that as well. But I believe the best solution for it is bringing these ideas into the marketplace of ideas and letting the good ones outweigh the bad ones in this competition, if you will. Because if you continue in this tirade of, like, you know, treat this ideology like Voldemort, the who does not speak their name, all that's going to happen is you're going to fester like a wound and they're going to keep repeating in their communities and telling themselves, look, guys, we have this ideology that no one even wants to challenge us on. We must be right. And that's a very dangerous methodology right there that I feel like people with the whole free speech argument tend to ignore. To who like the anti-free speech crowd, mm-hmm. mind you. Honestly, I think that not allowing free speech is kind of being a detriment to the left nowadays because you have so many of them who shouted down opinions that they didn't like to the point where they wouldn't actually listen to any arguments 
So nowadays, when it comes to people actually trying to debate, he, the people on the left have no idea how to combat even the simplest of arguments that people make. Agreed. It's just, and I see tons of times like Antifa, for example, which I feel should be labeled a terrorist organization, where they would quote unquote mutilate a philosopher called Popper and change his ideology of intolerance. Where they would say, for a tolerant society to exist, we need to allow us to be intolerant against intolerance. Which is absolutely not what Hop Popper meant. He meant in that sense, he was a British philosopher. He said, hey, when someone is saying things like, I'm going to get a bunch of guns together and we're going to come to your place and kill you. You don't say, oh, that's a logical inconsistency. <laughs> you fight back. That's what Popper would say. And, you know, there's a time and place for debate. But leftists are like, oh... We don't even want to entertain the idea of this becoming a thing. Therefore, we must silence it as soon as opportunity possible. And that train of thinking is very dangerous and authoritarian to me. And in general, like, I get slack because I got people on the far right who hate me. I got people on the far left who hate me. And I'm like, yeah, I'm still siding with individualism and against authoritarianism. Like, I openly say I denounce fascism. I denounce communism. I embrace Christ. That's my main messaging. And I don't feel like it's morally acceptable to si silence people or intimidate or threaten people's life, if you will, for just words. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so when it comes to Antifa, what argument would you have? Um, so you said that Antifa should uh, be classified as a terror organized terrorist organization. I 1000% agree, but there's this constant argument that I hear that uh, it doesn't really combat my point, but I, I don't really know how to fight it. Basically, what they say is Antifa isn't an actual organization. And how they classify this is that who is Antifa's leaders? My best response to that is there's been tons of extremist organizations that hide in the shadows that don't necessarily have abrupt leaders or out front. And someone saying, oh, there's no leader that does not make them any less of a terrorist group. Like, if you have a group of people walking around wearing the same symbol, covering their face, performing the same tactics, and they proudly proclaim their Antifa, I don't think you should look around and be like, okay, where's their leader, though? And then I'm like, well, do you not just see them bash that woman's skull into the ground? Yeah, but where's the leader? They're not a terrorist organization. I'm like, but you just saw them crush a woman's skull in, correct? <laughs> but that's not important. It's not, they're not a terrorist organization. Like, they're using threats, intimidation, and violence based on a political agenda that literally matches the legal specification of what defines a terrorist group. And that's just something that always irritates me. Like, if you want to, I know it sounds a bit semantic y, but I always go straight for the throat and juggler and go straight to the legal vernaculars of what makes a terrorist organization. And nowhere in there does it state they have to have a 100% direct leader. Okay, so I guess whenever I think of organization, I think of there being some sort of leader or something along those lines. But I, I definitely understand what you're getting at. Um, I think the funniest argument I've ever heard... Oh, shit. What was it? It was... Um, it, so, obviously, Antifa stands for anti-fascist. And the funniest argument I've ever heard was anyone can be an Antifa member. And the only reason I find this hilarious is because they use what I perceive to be fascistic, fascistic uh, methods into trying to um, pers persuade, I'm using quotations there, people into their belief. Exactly. It's like you be... It's like the Star Wars beam of the prequel where you've become what you sworn to destroy, basically. Mm -hmm. It's Obi-Wan telling, you know, a lost Anakin that has fallen to the Sith, being like, Anakin being like, I will crush all the fascists by any means necessary. And Obi-Wan's like, what? You are the fascists. <laughs> so if you had any specific prescriptions for how the West runs its... Uh runs the country what specific things would you kind of pinpoint definitely the age of isolation where 
people in their communities don't know each other and where people have become very complacent to i go to my nine to five job and i go out and drink like a small group of friends and that's it when i feel like it's very important to know your neighbors know your community like i always try to challenge people in this preposition where i say do you feel like you're not your community isn't as tight and you're like yeah i'm like okay then be the person to change it i'm like i encourage them try to go out and you know meet like five of your neighbors maybe like say hi to them if you're in suburbia you know get to know them get to know the people who literally ne live next to you for decades like i feel like that's just be a logical thing um my prescriptions mainly is this very cultural thing i feel like we have we're in an age of society we're so connected yet we're so alone at the same time if that makes any sense and i, totally I agree yeah, I just feel like people, you know, try to go out there, you know, get involved in groups, community stuff, like, focus on yourself and take care of your health. Like, everything starts at you. So if you see a problem in your community, ask yourself what I could be doing for that community. Ask yourself what you could be doing as a person for yourself. That's why I see. It's, there was a JFK quote where he says, What's the quote goes like? It's like, ask not what your country has done for you, but what you could do for your country. And I feel like that's still a very solid quote because it shows the same thing for community. Ask not what your community has done for you, but you've done your community. Like, I tell people, get involved in social services. Go out and, you know, help out and volunteer the soup kitchen. Help clean the local park. Do all these things. And I know people are like, oh, that's just a cop-out. That doesn't solve major issues. I'm like, sure. It doesn't solve major pressing issues. But these major pressing issues are not going to be fixed overnight. This there is no nightly remedy. It's going to be over a gradual period of reform and change in your community that's eventually going to butterfly effect and move out. Focus on yourself. Once you got yourself done, focus on your family. Once your family is set, then you can start going out and helping others, you know? And then you keep branching out to now your community is good. Why stop at your community? Why not your county? Why not your state? Why not get involved in things? And then why not your region? And then it just goes there and more and more and more. But that's my personal gripe, and I would say I need more people to do. Like, we're not going to solve climate change in one night. We're not going to save political division in one night. We need to start small and work our way up from there. Baby steps. Try to accomplish something each day, week, month, year, and work your way from there. Uh, honestly, I think that's really good advice because so when I think of making change, so... Uh, I lived in a suburb for the longest time. That's where I grew up. And then all of a sudden, uh, my junior year of high school, I ended up moving to this really, what well, I'm going to say small town is just under 7,000 people. So it's small, definitely smaller than the suburbs. And then afterwards, I ended up moving to Minneapolis. Um, if you know anything about Minneapolis, it is severely crime riddled. And when I always thought of prescriptions, it was always looking on the bigger picture, never trying to be like, okay, instead of trying to be like, how do I solve everything immediately? Uh, what I could never figure out was uh, wh where to start out small. So like, no joke, in my mind, because of the crime that was happening in Minneapolis, uh, I would literally be like, we need to get the National Guard in here and literally have them stationed at certain points, have a curfew, literally go completely fascist for like a month to kind of weed out the people who were drug dealers, murderers, uh, gangbangers, and all that stuff. Uh, my mind would only look at that big picture instead of trying to be like, okay, where's the starting point? Exactly. And that's always been a very much allure to authoritarianism because it would be so easy just to have a sweeping government come in and crush the people and put obedience to everyone. But at the end of the day, like I said earlier, throughout this whole thing against consequentialism, the ends don't justify the means. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel like it's morally acceptable to break people and lead by fear. And this goes back to paleo libertarianism, lead by the tongue, not by the sword, if you will. And I feel like a lot of us, we lose that where people on both far ends of the political spectrum are like, no, we need extremes. We need now. I disagree with that. I'm against the idea of like, you know, revolution. I'm against the re idea of takeover. I believe the best, most stable solution is gradual form over time. 
And people don't like to hear that because they say, no, I want this and I want it now. Like America is very consumer driven, very, I want it now, 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 mm-hmm. fast, fast, fast. You see, it's like, you know, Amazon, one day delivery, fast food. I say, hey, slow it down or not. You're going to have to, if you really want this gradual change over time, this big impact, you're going to have to work for it. You have to put effort into it. And you're not going to, you don't want to cut corners to get the results you want, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. What, what's the saying? Putting the carrot before the horse or whatever? I yeah, think putting the carriage a... before the course. Gotcha. I, I knew I was saying it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, so with everything that's been going on, specifically the last three years, how do you think that the current administration is doing? I feel like they very much fumbled on the COVID policy, and I feel like it was a very large step in intervention with government getting into the free market, which I heavily disagreed with. And I was was of the belief that, hey, if a certain community has certain views on a thing, like let's say COVID or pandemic policy, they should be allowed to do what they want with such policies, as in they should be allowed to do their thing. Mm Mm-hmm. They shouldn't be forced by some giant hand of the government to obey, if you will. And funny enough, that's why my profile picture is Roddy Piper from They Live. (laughs) I absolutely love the movie. And for people who don't know the movie, the whole premise is a guy has these glasses where when he puts them on these shades, he sees everything for what it really is. So he'll put on the shades at like a TV screen showing a news media outlet talking and then the moment he puts it on, it's like this grotesque image of like these alien looking humans. And they're just repeating the same message. Consume, obey, observe, consume, obey. And that's one word that, you know, any authoritarian figure puts in like obey, obey, obey. And then it's him coming to realization like, no, I'm an individual. I'm not going to fucking obey you. I'm going to stand out from the crowd because what I believe is you guys are doing is corrupt. <laughs> it's kind of like. You have a society basically where you have like let's say a hundred thousand people lined up on a cliff and they're all about to jump and then you're like I'm not gonna do this man and then people look at you weird like wow like what the fuck bro you're not gonna jump off the cliff with us what's wrong with you you don't want to join the group they're like no I think I'm good like I'm standing where <laughs> I am now <laughs> so if if we put you president uh, during the COVID situation without going into too much detail because again i am go i am streaming on twitch and youtube uh how do you think the covid policy is should have been handled 100 percent have tighter borders and go border-esque isolation where we're like saying okay we need to get a handle on what this is first before we let whoever in then i would definitely try my best to set up very small if you will, like encouragements for a community to be like, hey guys, this is an encouragement from what we got coming out now. You should check out this scientific research done on it. My third thing, I would 100% be against, you know, Twitter or any of these pol- like giant platforms doing mass censorship of like alternative ideas of mm-hmm. medicine and stuff like that. Because I feel like that done more damage than good, which me personally, I do, you know, quote unquote, believe. The current medical studies of what's going on i'm not an anti-vaxxer or anything but i feel like by them being so locked tight they literally made a saying hashtag trust the science it was very indoctrinating very brainwashed like no people should listen to doctors and listen to other arguments this goes back to free speech and you're the best solution because if you create an environment without free speech saying like no this is your only solution or you lose your job I don't feel like you're going to get people to hop on board like, oh, golly, I really should get the vaccine. Like, I don't think that would have been a good alternative. But that's what I would have done as president. Okay. Uh, so what do you think of them changing the definition of anti-vax? So, and what's, what's the new definition? So what it used to be was you are against all vaccines you don't want to have the, you either don't want them yourself or you don't want your kids to have any vaccines nowadays i i i looked it up at the time i haven't looked it up recently but the new definition of anti-vax is if you are not for vaccine mandates 
So if you are anti-vaccine mandate, technically you are anti-vax. I guess I'm anti-vax then. <laughs> I stand corrected in my earlier point. I'm anti back now. <laughs> um, are there any part of the Biden administration that you think he did a good job on or that you're happy with? In what regards? Um, so just as an example, like, don't get me wrong, I'm not happy about how it happened, but I am happy that he was able to bring home the troops from Afghanistan. I feel like it could have been done a lot better better but you've had what like four no three presidents now i think it's three three or four presidents now who've continuously said we're gonna bring these men home we're gonna bring them home and they have failed to do so for abc reason um biden was the first person to say we're gonna bring them home and even though he did it very sloppily he still he was able to make do on that promise Mm. I would say the only good thing I could think of Biden doing was probably natural disaster response because he was pretty quick on the National Guard in some instances of like hurricanes and shit. He did. I feel like he did a very good job on that. I'm going to give him that one. But the issue of like the Middle Eastern war, it's a bit of a can of worms, but... Mm. Right, it's a tough situation. Even what I say live, because like I said, I did have prior service, but I would say what Trump was shooting for was he was still getting people out of the Middle East. He just was doing it very gradually, while in a sense, Biden almost pulled the rug underneath them mm -hmm. and left overnight. And by doing so, immediately afterwards, you know. The entire territory, you know, the Middle East, it fell under Taliban rule over like a day. It like was not even a question. It collapsed. And to me, this goes back to consequentialism where Biden's clapping and being like, look, guys, I got the troop out, the troops out of the Middle East. And I'm like, OK, but now 20 years worth of work is down a drain and they're back to like ground one where they started, where you have authoritarian people in control. Right. And so, like, I agree. yeah, I agree with the sentiment we should have left, and I 100% believe we should have. I just, like I said earlier, it should have been more gradual. It shouldn't have been overnight like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, I mean, one thing that I, I will criticize Biden till the end of the earth was we had gone years without having a single casualty out there, and then the second we try and uh, pull our troops out, 12 people end up dying. Yep, from an explosion, mm -hmm. Marines. Um, so, just to, uh, even though I do not like Biden, I, I do have to give him his props in some instances, such as he did sign the CHIPS Act, which, uh, if I'm correct, it strengthened the uh, American manufacturing and increased uh, different innovation. Um, he also, oh, what was it? He... Hey, 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 he was the first Catholic president, and immediately he banned abortion. <laughs> the presidency, he was the president where Roe v. Wade was overturned. Oh. I mean, so, so I guess we gotta begrudgingly give that one to Biden. He, <laughs> he was the president was overturned under. And he, granted, I can only give him half credit on this, but as of right <laughs> now, uh, unemployment the unemployment rate is at the lowest it has ever been at. Again, I can only give him half credit because, so this exact statistic I read was he created the most amount of jobs when he inherited America during the middle of a pandemic where people were, as you said earlier, literally taken out of their job because it was either you're going to do A, otherwise you're going to lose B. And he gets credit for all of those people finally being able to go back to work. So I, I will never credit him for the jobs created, but the fact that as of right now, historically, we are at low unemployment. Well, you also have to look into what are the jobs, because this is a very... White House tends to do this a lot for both left and right presidents, where they'll be like, yeah, record low in unemployment. And then you immediately go into the data of like what jobs are being, you know, filled. And most of them are like janitor, second job working at McDonald's uh, to pay bills. 
So that's something when you hear record low unemployment, look at the data for what jobs are being filled because a lot of them aren't like specialty jobs or like one, you know, one household jobs, if you will. It's usually a struggling family forced to pick up a second job just to survive. So with that, that's something you gotta be careful of. But, but would that go into the low unemployment? Because technically, if they're getting a second job, um, they were already employed. So Yeah, no, I'm saying that, but it's also for, uh, what's it called, for people who don't have a job at all. Now they're like just working at McDonald's or something like that, or they're being uh, okay. janitor. So you just have to go dig a little deeper and get into the actual specifications of, is this a high-value job, or is this a... A mediocre job. I, I remember seeing this one Twitter post where uh, she, w I don't even remember her name, but she was bragging about how um, no job is unskilled labor. And she, as evidence for it, she had posted a video of this person who probably had worked at that job for a really long time and all they were doing was rolling stuff up but they were able to do it and very quickly and so when she was saying it's un like that's apparently skilled labor in my mind i'm thinking no that's not skilled labor although he is skilled at the labor he does yeah this is if your labor is able to be replaced within a hat's notice where you get anyone to teach a job within a day i don't see it as being a skilled labor like i don't see flipping burgers at mcdonald's to be quote unquote skilled labor and i know this may sound very harsh or blunt and for anyone listening who does work at these jobs my apologies but to me skilled labor is working like a specialty like you know a neurosurgeon that's something you have to spend a decade or more studying just to do that's a skilled labor you know Getting your degree in law and becoming a lawyer. So that's a skilled labor. It's a specialization. Like, people just seem to overuse the word skilled labor without really knowing what it means. So, something I think is really funny that you just said is you talked about flipping burgers at McDonald's. Um, I can actually speak a little bit to this because I worked at McDonald's for six, uh, yeah, six years. And you actually don't flip burgers at McDonald's. You literally push a button uh a, it's called a platen so it's a bottom grill and then like a top grill the top grill comes down and just basically presses the meat together uh um, it's so stupid easy that no joke within six months i went from uh just a regular employee to a manager like granted i will admit that i had really good work ethic but it's yeah, I feel like good stupid. work ethic is the starting point from going from a like unskilled job to like a skilled job because I'm sure management was something you had to learn. It wasn't something that you just picked up overnight. I'm hoping, unless McDonald's is just that bad at service. <laughs> well, uh, I will say the only part of uh, the manager style that I really had to learn was how to take criticism from customers. And by that, I mean the first time a customer came up to me with a complaint, I literally stood there like a deer in headlights and was like, yep, anything you need to make you happy, anything you need, I will do everything for you. And it took me time to finally learn, like, you know what? The customer is not always fucking right. I remember a high school job I had. I was working at a car wash and... Funny enough, I had this guy pull up with a Ford F-150 Raptor and just drove straight through and then when I was telling him to stop. And then afterwards, he got mad because he messed up his car. I was like, sir, I was telling you to stop. And then he called me a dirty, I'm not going to say the word because you're on Twitch, yeah. but slur. And then he proceeded to spit a loogie in my fucking face. Ooh. And then I was just standing there and then I remember... That day, I was extremely sick. I ended up having a flu, but I ended up passing out from heat exhaustion immediately after. And my boss just came by, and he was like, what happened? I'm like, that dude just said something to me. And then my boss looked over, and I was like, you, you are no longer allowed on our premises ever again. And he's like, oh, do you know who I am? Do you know who I work for? He's like, I do not give a fuck, sir. He's like, get off my property. I was like, based, let's go. I've never seen, or I've never understood why people use that as a, 
like a defense. Like, do you know who I am? Obviously not. If you were anyone of importance and I knew you were someone of importance, I, I obviously would have just, I, I would have handled the situation differently than just being like, no, get the fuck off my property. <laughs> yeah, you got him with the hippity hoppity fuck off my property line. <laughs> I've never heard that issues. one. Yeah, I always say hippity hoppity fuck off my property, and that usually <laughs> works very well. Uh, so, with it becoming almost 2024 here in about six months, um, obviously that means the uh, election is coming up. Who would you like to see go up against Biden? Um, that's a tight one. I feel like DeSantis is a younger version of Trump, and he's more... He watches what he says a bit more, but if Trump wants to run again for the lulls, I would actually find that absolutely hilarious. <laughs> because what I love about Trump is I don't even like the dude mainly as a person, but he was just such a wake-up call and an entire bitch slap to modern politics that, like, hey, if a guy like me could get in, think about what else like you know get your stuff together it's like and then democrats complain like oh why did trump ever get elected it's like well because you've been failing on your promises for decades oh of course and it's just yeah so i'm actually in the same boat i was one of the questions i was going to have was trump or desantis and i'm i'm definitely more for desantis even though he seems to be losing the polls when it comes to uh those two um do you think that he actually has a shot at winning or do you think it's definitely going to be a repeat of 2020 where it's Trump versus Biden? Mm, I don't know if you want my honest opinion. I feel like it's pretty split 50-50. I think it's a close one, though. Uh, I think the most recent poll that I saw, granted this was like two months ago, so it definitely could change, had DeSantis down by like 36 points. Oh, really? Yeah. You think who do you personally think is going to get a good shot? Trump or DeSantis? Uh, so um, I hate it, but I I fully believe that the Republicans are going to choose Trump, um, and that's mainly because it, Trump has an ego that the Republicans seem to really like. Um, not only that, but then you have the fact that the left media would embellish things so much to the point where they were almost flat out lies when it came to Trump. Um, so I feel like he's probably going to have the edge over DeSantis. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, I can see that, though. That's... Mm. Yeah, but what is Trump going to promise, though? I feel like he's going to have a lot more baggage from his last presidency because he didn't build a wall, which he said he was going to do, unfortunately. So, like... It's kind of like one of those things like I voted for you once and you mm -hmm. didn't fo follow up with your promises. Why should I vote for you again? That's my main question I asked Trump supporters. Like, if he didn't follow in, why would I support him again? And another thing, too, Trump was very in favor of removing due process when it comes to firearm restrictions. Where he, he quote, said, take the bump stops first, ask questions later. And that's something I was very, yeah, on edge about. Where I'm like, yeah, I don't know about this one. Yeah, he definitely tried to do things uh, not, what's the correct word, not, um, I, I can't think of the right word, but not in the normal way. Uh, he was more of a, I'm going to do this now and then deal with the repercussions later. So, I mean, that's why I think that he wasn't really able to get any bills passed except for, I think it was the tax decrease. Um like all of, I believe all of his plans or all of the things that he did end up doing in office were all by executive action. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can see that. I think what else? What's one topic that you care the absolute most? Like, what's if you had to pick one topic, what is it when it comes to politics? Um, I'm very in favor of pro-life. I'd say that's my main thing. Always has been, always will be. It's one thing that, that remains consistent throughout my life. How, uh, how do you feel about, what was it, the Pope excommunicating Biden? Something along those lines? I don't remember exactly what it was. 
Yeah, so basically you cannot be Catholic and pro-choice. Mm-hmm. And because Catholics believe that it is life is intrinsic from the moment of natural birth, sorry, moment of natural conception to the moment of natural death. So it is immoral for you to interfere or engage in someone's life unless your life is being presently threatened or your people, such as, you know, all Christianity is trying to be killed. So you could say just war theory, but that's a bit more medieval, if you will. We don't use that as much anymore. So. To be Catholic and to say that it is a woman's choice is to not be Catholic at all because that's you spitting in the face of thousands of years of Catholicism and church teaching, which is completely morally against it. So the church is allowed to refuse you Holy Communion, which is a very important thing, Catholicism. And that's been a pretty big slap in the face of Biden, but he's still calling himself Catholic for some reason. Like, he's one of those people, he's Catholic in name only. You can't be a Catholic and, like, be pro-choice. It's just one of those things. Um, so how would you combat people whenever they say, oh, what was I, I believe it's something along the, the lines of, um, in the Bible, it states that life begins at first breath. I would go against that notion by bringing up Jeremiah one fifteen, which says, I have, knew, I have known you since you were formed in the womb. For I set you out for a purpose to be destined to lead many of nations, which basically talks about in a text of the Pharisees asking, you know, what is the purpose of life? What is the purpose of a human type thing? Like, does God really have a plan for everyone? And God says, you know, in that verse, like, hey, I have destined to you. I have known you since you weren't even born yet. And I have a plan for you. I'm going to use you in many ways. It doesn't make logically consistent sense to say oh, God is okay if you destroying his creation when he specifically says in the Bible that, hey, I have a plan set out for you. And what the older verses, that's mainly uh, more of a Jewish thing where Jewish people interpret it as a certain way, but Catholics and other people argue it differently. Where when it says, you know, on first breath, they believe as a Catholic that that's when you have, quote unquote, you know, an actual like embrace in the world where you're no longer part of your mother's womb and you're part of quote unquote a person willing to be let's say in Catholic sense baptized or brought about among the faith if you will that's the reason like you can't baptize a baby in a woman's stomach Mm -hmm. but that's um, my answer to that so kind of going back to religion I believe so uh, I grew up Lutheran which I believe they is um, where Something along the lines of like all babies are automatically forgiven of the uh forgiven, whereas and again I could be mistaken. Catholicism is no, you're not forgiven for your sins until you've been baptized. Um, do I have that correct? And if I do, what's what do you kind of say against that? Um, so Catholics believe in the belief of what's called what's it? innate sin which means that all of us are born without sin all of us Mm -hmm. are born folly and people get mad and they're like oh what did i do wrong i'm like you're telling me your entire life you lived perfect like all of us have sinned all of us have fallen short by the grace of god But that's the whole point of religion to be that safety net for us to watch out for us but that i don't believe you know quote unquote anyone is just you know boom they're perfect they're born perfect like that but for that sense I know Catholics say if the baby's born, stillborn, that it's not going to heaven. I mean, no, sorry. It's not going to hell. Like, the baby's fine. Like, the soul's just, you know, brought back up to heaven. Okay. I, I just heard that yeah, question once. Really, yeah, theologically based one. That's a tough one I need to read into more, though. I haven't been asked that question in years now that I think about <laughs> it. It's a good one. <laughs> if you had to pinpoint it other than you providing a free speech platform how do you think you've gotten the followers you have because i i honestly i try so hard to stay on twitter and i've tried retweeting stuff i've tried commenting on people's stuff i feel like i've been trying different ways to play the algorithm but i don't know if it's just my beliefs that people aren't really into or if it i'm doing something wrong uh, the trick is knowing people and connections. I okay. think I told you before, but I have a couple of mutuals that have over like 100k followers, 400k followers. 
And it's just knowing those people, one. And two, what's helped me a lot was branching out and meeting different ideologies, different groups. Like, I have friends in, you know, Muslim squares. I have friends in Catholic squares, Protestant squares, Hindu squares. I have friends on the left, right, that I disagree with, but I still stay cordial with. And I guess what's something I done too? Yeah, I spent less time, quote unquote, arguing in actually like text format mm -hmm. because nobody loves, nobody likes to see someone's page just quote tweet after quote tweet after quote tweet after quote tweet. You want to save that for the absolute peak dog shit take that you know you could dunk on. Okay. And um, what's it called? I will say another thing that's helped me a lot is, like I said, that just having connections. But I run like three or four different group chats on Twitter, and I'm in some pretty big group chats. And just knowing people, and every now and then, if it's something you want to like really boost, like if I post a meme, I'm not gonna be like, "Hey guys, boost this immediately." But if it's right. like something I really enjoy or I feel like it's important, like you know, debates, I'll shoot that out to like let's say five group chats, and all of the group chats have like 80 plus people in them. And then that helps get it circulated into the algorithm. But what's another thing? Yeah, I would say bad publicity is good publicity as well, but you don't want to keep that your main domain. Yeah. So dabbling in the controversy every now and then always helps because it gets people commenting and it indirectly boosts your views and stuff like that. But I feel like that's something that helps a lot for me, but just patience and luck. That's all it is. Okay. And just being authentically yourself, like a good chunk of like what I tweet and stuff is just my own stuff. I don't really spend much retweeting, and when I do, I it's something I find that aligns with my views or I like it's important. Um, and oh yeah, staying consistent. That's another thing I'd recommend for people. Just try to post at least once a day. That's the general rule of thumb I make for myself. Like even something. Um, I would say, yeah, definitely do that. Post once a day. Okay. So, speaking of Twitter, now it's time to go in on your, uh, I have a few things. I was able to go back literally up until, I think it was February, late January. Um, so I went, I, I feel like I went pretty far back in your Twitter. Oh, God. <laughs> what Let's did go. Liam Neeson do? That is a very long story. <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up. I despise that man with a burning and fiery passion. What like, did he do? All, like, I kid you not, he is the one person where all, you know, I feel the Catholicism and all, like, moral ethical code leave my body when I see that man. I just, I'm like a bull. I just see red. I'm like, I'm going to mess this man up. Like, no, it was just, it started as a joke from one of my group chats. Space Cowboys is one I host okay. a lot. And hey, shout out to Space Cowboys if you're listening to this. But um, it was a giant meme where people were going down a list of like, you know, great, you know, actors. And someone I forgot who put number one Liam Neeson. And I'm like, why though? And then immediately I got jumped by like 40 plus people in the chat. They're like, oh, you don't think Liam Neeson's good? He's like peak acting. He's like the best thing since last night. And then I got so infuriated. I'm like, no, I'm not going to be gaslit to believe some dude that like stares at the camera like a lost puppy is a good actor. And then they're all like, oh, but have you seen Taken though? Taken's so oh good. I'm like, okay, yeah, whatever. I don't think it's that good. And then they're like, oh, Solo, how can you say that? The movie was the greatest thing ever. And I'm like, no, I refuse to be gaslit to believe this is good. <laughs> like, I'm not letting you guys do this to me. So, so it's just been, it's more of a running gag, if anything. Like, um, although I would definitely knock his fucking block off if he tries <laughs> me. I'm not actively hunting Liam Neeson in the streets at this moment. <laughs> Yeah, because I know I saw one post about Liam Neeson that was like, okay, you just don't like him or something like that. And then I looked at your bucket list, and it, granted, it says in no particular order, number one is beat Liam Neeson in a bar fight. <laughs> <laughs> I think in total I have like around close to 4,000 tweets because I've had this account for like two years. Okay. I've made at least 10 Liam Neeson tweets throughout my time on Twitter, just dogging on Liam Neeson. <laughs> and it's just always been a funny, like, running gag. Like, 
Well, so, uh, what, no. what you're saying is I have to go on the computer, go onto your page, and control F Liam Neeson. Hey, hey, how about we don't do that? We got this <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> so, uh... But, like, in all seriousness, though, like, if you ever watch his acting, he looks like a lost puppy just staring into a light. Or, like, you know... He looks like a dog sitting next to you that when you're eating that you're not giving it food and it's just sitting there like dead eyeing you trying to get like a little crumb off your plate. I'm like, no, get out of here. I'm not giving you anything. And people are like, oh, 10, 10 best actor of the award goes to. And I'm like, no, like this is horrible. So obviously Liam Neeson is in the Taken franchise, but what other se- like what other movies are he is he in? I literally could not tell you any other movies. He's in um, a Crusader movie, and he's also in, what's it called? He's in that movie about the Irish immigrants in America and okay. then the nativist party going against them. I forgot what it's called. It's the guy who wears the top hat in it, and he has two axes and like really cool mustache. Fuck, what is the name of that movie? It was a really good movie. Leonardo DiCaprio was in it as well. Okay. But Liam Neeson, yeah, in it, and he just killed the performance, and not in a good way. Like He was just bad. <laughs> <laughs> so are, are you a rave person um <laughs> i've dabbled yes like we could put it politely like that i've dabbled <laughs> but uh that's I, more of the, that's old solar right there <laughs> okay <laughs> uh so then adopt two kids and be a father um is it mainly just you want to be a a father or is it uh, adopting two kids like really important um i feel like both is an importance because i see a lot of kids who do not have families and i feel like me giving back to the world and me to have my own to bear my own children but to also adopt as well to bring to my family so i find both to be equal of importance okay and that's personally there's no logical reason for it. i just feel like that's one of god's callings for me so something I am I'm super open about my life, but one thing that a lot of people don't know is that my grandparents ended up adopting not only me, but my older brother and then my two younger sisters. Um and so not only did they have four kids of their own, uh, but by the time they were they adopted us, they were in their like fifties, and then they adopted four more children. And I don't get me wrong. They definitely made mistakes with uh, raising us, but uh, I couldn't be any more grateful because who knows where I could have gone. I could have been in foster homes for years. I could have gone towards an abusive family. Um, One thing that they don't really do all too well in the adoption system is actually look into the families that that, that adopt. Are you planning on adopting any children? Um, it so it really all depends on how many kids we end up having. If we only have two kids, I would love to adopt at least one. Um, but if we end up, if I somehow end up convincing her to have three or four kids, so granted, my I was a very like special case because of what a gone on my parents were my birth parents were deemed unfit to be parents and so there's a long court case on uh who would actually gain the rights to us four children um so my parents that i grew up with they actually ended up spending about forty two thousand dollars just on me and my brother alone and so if it's anywhere along that cost I don't think I'm going to be able to adopt any more than one kid. That's fair. Hey, Godspeed to you trying to get your wife to get you more kids. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can like hope. the best solution for <laughs> your actual family. It's a more satisfying, happy life. Oh, after, like I said, after having this one kid, she literally is asking the doctor, when can we have another kid? Uh, the doctor just told us today that they want us to wait um at preferably a year until she gives birth to another kid so nicole was she was super upset about that being like i I want another kid now 
Um, but you know, if I can, if the morning sickness isn't as bad, near as bad as our, with our first kid, I feel like I might be able to convince her. Best of luck for that. Uh, if you don't mind me asking, is it a boy or a girl? Uh, so we have a boy. Are you trying to shoot to have a girl or what are you trying to do? Fingers crossed a girl, but I mean, I, I'll be happy either way. Something that I found out literally like months ago was my birth dad uh if he, my birth mom would have told her or told him that i was a boy he would have pushed her to get an abortion because he really wanted a boy and a girl um Jeez. so luckily she kept it <laughs> hidden from him until it was too late to the point where he he didn't have a say on uh if she got an abortion or not Something that I also so something that I found out from uh, doing the uh, research on what would have been my debate with Bunk is that fetuses actually feel um, a lot earlier than what was perceived. I believe what it used to be was uh, fetuses don't feel anything up until somewhere along the twenty-two week mark. Um, what the studies have shown is that because the nervous system is so intri like intricate by week five, um, they can start to feel pain and other things around week five to week eight. Really? Mm hmm That's sad. And, I mean, if you think I, about you it... See, you can see studies, too, where this is really upsetting but like during abortions we're actually you know scanning and stuff like that you'll see the baby actively trying to avoid yep. the tools to pull it out and it's i don't know to me it's just very disturbing and upsetting i i don't understand how people could defend such a position but they hey they do it's <laughs> yeah the only argument i've seen against that because i heard that as well was um during different exams they Man, I don't remember the name of the study, but they basically stuck something in there, and I think it was around 8% of the time the needle struck the fetus. And what they were trying to say was if it was conscious and was able to actually um, be aware of its surroundings, that number would be at 0%. Uh, going through some dark times, but it's not so over. We still we're so back. We got this. <laughs> what I, I liked it was, there was a funny meme. It showed the yin and yang, and the yin said it's so over, and the yang said we are so back. And I'm like the ultimate cycle of like right wing politics. <laughs> it's, like, it's over. We're back. Um, so, oh, I have another question. Do you believe in evolution? And the, uh, the reason I asked that is because I saw something that was on your page twice, where it was talking about where's the evolution. I believe it was in these different insects or something along the lines. Um, honestly, the pictures were moving so fast that it wasn't really easy to distinguish what type of animal they were. Um, but it was going back like centuries, and it was like... Uh, Where's the evolution or something like that when it came to these specific animals? I don't believe in Darwinism. I feel like it lacks the burden of proof and a lot of evolution I feel is shaky at best. The difference from Darwinism and evolution is Darwinism basically stated that we did not have a creator, but we shared a common ancestor that eventually led us to the point we are here. And I've had okay. a lot of critique and arguments. So my first big critique is, oh, well, there's a common ancestor, there's a missing link. And I'm saying, well, where's the missing link? And you see in Darwin's journals, he would say, oh, we don't have the technology to discover now, but believe me, it's out there. We'll get it. It's the year 2023, and scientists have still not found the missing link. And this is also a commonality between many species. Okay. Not many, but like many main primary mammal species where they always point and say, oh yeah, we believe we evolved. And I'm like, okay, evolved from what? A missing link in the starting point. Okay, do we have evidence to the starting point? No, we don't. 
So it's not... I disbelieve in it because at the end of the day, I see it as a theory. Mm-hmm. And all theories have the burden of proof because they are the ones making the claim. And I feel it lacks the burden of proof to make the claim. Another good example was... um. Something that bothered Darwin, he ended up writing a lot about this. This is a fun thing. I've read really much from Darwin. Fascinating character. He would basically openly admit to his Achilles heel being, I have been able to use carbon dating to match the fossil records, proving my theory so far, except for one giant gaping hole known as the Cambrian period. The Cambrian period had no fossilization or records in there showing or proving his theory in fact they had quite the opposite there was nothing there and by darwin's logic there should have been something there to show a common trend of evolution throughout species that led to the events of where we are today but there was nothing okay so darwin what he ended up proposing was oh during that period of time there were cephalopods a cephalopod cephalopod is a species with an exterior exoskeleton that is a bit squishy and soft if you will so he basically chalked it up to, oh, you know, the reason they couldn't fossilize is because their organism was not built for fossilization. Therefore, that's why we don't see any fossils there. And haha, evolution still stands. Only for um, Jeremy Hooks and Jason Bell, two leading scientists, to come by and say, well, I just found jellyfish that was fossilized during the Hadrian period or Cambrian period. So your theory doesn't add up. How are you saying these species are not fossilized here, but we have literal species of jellyfish that have no bone or muscle tissue that are fossilized? Like, how does that logically make sense? Okay. And and then Darwin again did another leap, and he said, okay, well, still, they could have just broken down just because jellyfish, he says, they have something unique about them. Um, and they were broken down so small to a bacteria level that there's no way it could have been fossilized. And then here comes the next guy. <laughs> and the next guy says, well, actually, we were able to find fossilized bacteria. Bacteria from that time period, thus making another giant Achilles heel in his argument. And eventually, he basically, that was the one thing on his deathbed he really irked him because he couldn't find the answer for it. And most of his scientific journals was him brushing it off and saying, oh, I guess eventually we'll figure it out. Which, to this day, they still never figured out the thing about fossils or the Cambrian period. Okay. So... so yeah, one issue I have with it. So just, just to kind of clarify, your big issue with Darwinism is just because it, says, it basically states that there is no higher power because of evolution. Um, is that correct? Um, I would say not even that. that. Like I could completely, re- you could completely be non-religious and still not believe in evolution. That's not always okay. the key. So, like I said, my original point: I believe evolution, like many scientific theories, is still that just a theory. And like any theory, you were the one preposition prepositing a claim, and I feel the claim lacks the burden of proof to show why it's legitimate, and that's why I do not subscribe to the ideology of you know Darwinism or evolution. I do know they are, it is allowed by the Catholic Church, some of them to say like, hey, you could believe in evolution or Darwinism, because like I said earlier, Darwinism claims that we were not made by a higher creator, we were made from a common ancestor or the missing link, which still has not been found or proven, and Catholicism said if you want to say, you know, evolution was used for a tool of God's creation to make us, then that's okay, which I'm a bit iffy on, but... That's what I always I believed. Say, yeah. Yeah, that's something I always look into where I'm just a bit shaky on or I'm like, eh. But there's still people think that's a set and shut case, but I freely encourage people like um what's it Hoover Institute has like a three hour video of like some of the leading um archaeological scientists. And it's just a room of them, like six of them, and they're all talking for six hours about all the flaws of evolution and like the theory. And that was something that really solidified a lot of my views on it, too. And reading their research papers on it. Um, David Covind was another prominent guy who was very against evolution. But, yeah, it's just, I don't know. I felt like it's one of those topics people think is already shut and closed, when in reality it's anything but that. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it would be a law, not a theory. 
Yes. <laughs> um. So, just quick question: How much can you deadlift right now? <laughs> uh, my deadlift right now is close to four hundred twenty-five pounds. And you're trying to deadlift six hundred? Jesus Christ! Yeah. Um. Um. All gas, no brakes. <laughs> Uh, so, what tips do you have to kind of keep that motivation? What's up? Uh, what kind of tips do you have to keep that motivation? So, like, um, my biggest issue with trying to go and work out, other than having a needy girlfriend and a newborn, is the fact that I just, I have no motivation. I, unless someone is, is there to keep me accountable, it is very difficult for me to do these things on my own. My best advice, okay, so I could give you gym bro advice, and then I could give you personal advice. So the gym bro advice is like general good advice for anyone, and if anyone's listening, good advice for working out. Remain consistent. Find yourself a partner you go to the gym with that keeps you in check and accountable when you keep them accountable. And also try your best to have realistic standard like remove your ego you're there for yourself not to impress others because i remember being younger i was actually before military i weighed around 240 close to and i was like fat and i was a mess and i didn't know what i was doing in my life and i said yeah i don't want to go out like this basically so i'm enlisting and i ended up losing a bunch of weight and i got down to around like 170 close to so then I started going to the gym and getting muscle, but my first thing I was doing was I was lifting weight way outside of my range. And I was basically, it's called ego lifting, where you're lifting weight that you know you can't handle. And I was mm-hmm. just getting injured. It was very silly. And I took a hard look at myself and I said, the reason I'm doing this is quote unquote for, you know, I'm just doing it to, you know, fight my demons or I'm doing this to battle all these things or I'm doing this because maybe then girls would like me. No. All that shit's superficial. Um, um, what's it called? I really feel like what's best for young men is do it for yourself above anyone else. Like, you don't go to the gym to impress other people. You don't go and show up so other people can see you're at the gym. You do that purely for yourself. Um, that's my gym bro advice. My personal advice, I like to look good naked, so I want to be in shape. <laughs> well, that's literally my honest take my gym bro advice. <laughs> But yeah, sorry, that was a bit blunt. But that's uh, people <laughs> think. Oh, you got this deep trend. I'm like, well, oh, I just like being very strong, lifting heavy o- objects, and just looking good naked. So, like, I used to back in high school, the max I ever weighed was 145, and that was during football season. So I'm obviously working out quite a bit. Um, but then. Within the last, like, two years, that's when my metabolism really started to slow down. Um, I am actually at the most weight I have ever been at right now. Last time I weighed myself, I was 210. Um, And it's just, it makes me feel absolutely terrible. Um, I did have a regular schedule before Dakota was born. But then, uh, like, the day or the week of dakota's birth i basically was like you know what i'll get back into it after a while get into like a routine and it's just been super hard for me to get that motivation to go back i think about it like this well this is why i tell myself too i know this is a bit i know i don't have children yet but i always want to say I want to be the dad that's physically in shape enough when he's older to be able to do physical things with my son or daughter. I don't want to be one of those those dads you see that have like a giant muffin top and they just sit around all day. Like, it's very easy to be complacent. It's very easy to get comfortable because comfortable you're protected. But I try to do my best to go against it and enable a system of discipline because one of my primary driving philosophies is discipline equals freedom. And when people hear that, they think it's contradictory. Like, how can you have more discipline when it's the opposite of freedom? I don't see it as such. Discipline to me says I'm able to lay out a schedule, a plan to go accordingly, thus making me have more free time to do where I feel like it's more well-earned. 
because what's better, you know, coming home after a long day of hard work, busting your ass off, knowing you provided for your family, or laying in your bed all day, not doing anything, just sc doom scrolling through YouTube shorts, or going through your phone. Both of those equations, you are, quote-unquote, having free time, but which one feels more well-earned? Right. Whenever I think of... Uh, so, discipline equals freedom is actually... Uh, I think it's a really good mantra to have, mainly because when I think of it, I think of uh, addictions. And e even if you're free to indulge in your addictions, if you have an addiction, are you really free? Because you're consistently beholden to those addictions to the point where um, you're not really you able to... What was mm -hmm. that? I said you become a slave of such thing. And Exactly. One of my favorite ratios on Twitter was that there was this guy who kept following me around and would basically be my reply guy for any remotely religious tweet. And I remember one tweet I posted was like very niche it was on the political systems of the Catholic Church. And he decided to say, you know, religion rots your brain. And I knew this person that he proudly proclaims how he you know excuse my language masturbates you know numerous times a day and consumes porn and smokes weed and he thinks he's so happy and so good and then he tried to say you know religion rots your brain and i said my religion tells me to go against anything that is my knee-jerk reaction to what is good mm -hmm. if anything you i was like you consume pornography all day long and you smoke you know you smoke pot all day Who's really the slave here? The guy who's actively trying to avoid these like cheap corners and stuff or harmful things? Or is it the guy who's actually working hard for themselves to have a moral code in instilled within him? So I'm like, it's always something I found to be funny when people say religion is like slavery. I think it's a very silly thought process. Right. Yeah. I, yeah, I completely understand. I, I, I agree. Fucking. I know that whenever I was smoking weed daily, I specifically quit because Dakota because Dakota was going to be born. Um, and so that was kind of like my motivating factor for stop smoking. Um, I still drink occasionally, but that's not near as bad as it was. Um, but I, I never really thought I, I was the type of person who was like, oh, I can quit anytime I want to. And then something would come up where I i had to quit and uh I, I i physically could not like uh, i know nicole when she would uh quit smoking she would get angry i was the type of person who um I, I basically was just constantly lying to myself saying like i can do this i can do this when uh i really just need to find that motivation to be able to stop but now that i am stopped fuck uh, aside from going to the gym i am the most um, persistent at the things that I truly like, like want to do. Like I'm trying to go back to school. I'm trying to actually get a, um, like a, a foot in the door with politics. I'm trying to act as the type of person who, uh, wouldn't clean anything until it actually became an issue. And now if you look at my apartment, aside from like a couple things, it's, it's fucking amazing. Um, the fact that people let these addictions rot their brain so much to the point where they don't think that they have an issue, uh, honestly, is, is going to be the detriment to, to America in my mind. I want people to know, too, if anyone's listening is recording back to it, I'm not trying to pitch, like, you know, a moral ethical code where you are to be bound without making any mistakes. We're human. We're going to make some mistakes. Mm -hmm. I asked this, what is something you have more respect for someone who's never got knocked down once, but they're constantly doing their thing or someone who's repeatedly knocked down, but he refuses to stay down. And he keeps going up. Like I've always, I know it sounds weird, but if I'm in a gym and I see a guy who's absolutely shredded head to toe, and then I see a dude who's morbidly obese, but he's consistently there every single day doing something. I have more respect for the guy who's morbidly obese because he's on a lot of a hard... He's going up against an upper hill battle a lot more. 
and it's something I just found interesting. But yeah, obviously, don't like self-flagellate yourself if you didn't like pick up one cup or something like that. Mm-hmm. Like, but you should also, like you said, be consistent enough where you don't like procrastinate become a problem. But at the end of the day, I truly believe people are good at heart, and I just wish the best for people. And it's frustrating because, like, I see so much evil in the world, yet I refuse to let it break me. I always tell myself, like, no matter how bad things get, I refuse to be an evil person. Like, I'm still standing by that. Like, I'm not going to let the world destroy me. I'm not going to let these negative influences get to me. Like, I'm still going to remain consistent. And because I believe truly that is me. That is who Solo Requiem is. I will not break under the weight of, you know, pressure by society. I just won't. And as long as I could confidently say that and hold that, I feel like I am being true to myself to who I am as a person. Why do you want to move to Montana? Montana is absolutely beautiful. I love the lands over there, and I love privacy. And I feel like people say Alaska is the final frontier, but honestly, there's so much untouched land. And Idaho, Montana, it's absolutely stunningly gorgeous. And honestly, me being in nature makes me feel a lot more happier and at ease than me being in a bustling city or suburbia. Like, I could... If you want me to be honest, I could transmit or commute to a city like probably once every other month. Mm-hmm. Well, even then, I feel like it's weird. I feel claustrophobic. I feel trapped. I feel drained. Everyone is like not giving a fuck about each other. Everyone only cares about themselves. It's very toxic. And I'm just like, I don't want this, you know? So that's why I always thought, you know, what's it called? I always thought that is very beautiful over there, and I just love to have the privilege to just move over there. But I'm also trying to become a doctor and perform. What's it? Pursue. Sorry, excuse me. Pursue a field in psychiatry where I could be able to study medicine and study, you know, I guess the human mind, if not. And that's been my main driving goal. And recently, mental health has been getting slowly destigmatized, which I think is a very good thing. Mm-hmm. and I feel like it is a market that is going to be plentiful to get into by the time I get my PhD and I'm finally practicing. And what better place than Montana to get people, you know, help that's out there. So I thought that would be a good marketing idea, and that's my go-to plan right now. So what would you say to people in, like, the Red Pill commun- community who say that mental health issues is literally just psychosomatic? It's all in your head. I would say tread very carefully because I understand why some people could see it that way. And I feel like a lot of stuff, especially like TikTok, where you'll see kids Mm self-diagnose. I I'm of the belief that self-diagnosis is a very bad idea and thing. And I feel like a lot of people in the red pill community attack those things. But if they looked into like actual meta-analysis data or like, you know, neuroscientific reports, you could see uh, there's an actual chemical imbalance and brain pattern cognition it, error with people who have, you know, quote unquote, depression. Same as you can see lack of certain gray matter or non functioning penal gland for people who have sociopathy or psychopathic tendencies. Because, fun fact, um, leading scientists right now are actually pushing for the notion that psychopaths are both created and born, where sometimes it's very rare. You would see people who are born with a very small, if you will, pineal gland, and that could be very detrimental to understanding such things like, you know, apathy or empathy or human correlation connection. While children who go through extremely traumatic incidents of abuse end up creating a sense where their brain, while still in development, says, I'm not in a safe environment, I am not protected. I am going full survival mode. I need to know how I could live. And thus doing so, their brain focuses on more of the archaic primitive side where it says, you know, survival, 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 instead of like actually dwelling and understanding emotional, you know, unity of people or understanding feelings. And that's why you see, I remember reading a really disturbing study done by the Soviet Union, which uh, piss on their grave too. They literally, <laughs> they took 
infants, like l- newborn babies from the mothers. And they kept them completely isolated. And they wanted to do a study saying, what happens if we have children and we give them no physical affection? We only give them food and water. Mm. And they did this for a study of a dozen children. And they said their main goal, they want to create the perfect soldier, one immune to all emotion who doesn't hesitate on, you know, pulling the trigger like morality. It's an ob- obedient servant who, like, obeys commands, which I think is absolutely abhorrent, despicable. And, yeah, they ended up coming to those conclusions where those kids end up being very mentally disturbed and disgruntled and very hollow if you will the lights were on but nobody were home and that's why Mm -hmm. i feel like it's important to show children love and i can't imagine how evil you'd have to be to perform a study such as that but so which do you uh which do you think is more important nature or nurture i feel nature is far more important and my reasoning why is because it's more closely correlated to an individual one-on-one level compared to... Sorry, no. Did I say nature or nurture? I think I flipped it. You said it. nature. My apologies. I meant to say nurture. Um, yeah, it's a bit late. Um, yeah, nurture definitely because it's a more one-on-one correlation between a bond of a mother and a child or a father and a son. And I see that as being more important in like an area you're living in. Okay. Because at the end of the day, who raises you? Is it your parents or is it, you know, the city you live in? I'd you say it's a mixture say, like, of both. Yeah, you say a mixture of both, but like, which one do you think is more? Type oh, okay. thing? Definitely your parents. Or that's the way it should be anyway. I feel like nowadays uh, people... So, do you think that people being overly nurtured is um, what's contributing to would I perceive people being a lot more mentally unstable nowadays? Or what do you think is causing the mental instability that we're kind of seeing an increase of? Um, I feel like it's going back to my original point I've been saying where we're having a society of people who are the most connected yet have no sense of like community. And I feel like if you don't have a social connection outside of like the internet that it's going to be very detrimental and negative for your health and like i said back to earlier i just i wish people would go out you know actually get engaged and involved more in your community because it always leads to more happiness than someone who just does their own thing goes to their nine to five and comes home when you're on like a twitter space okay also people are getting fat and they're not working out go to the gym (laughs) don't be a lazy bitch (laughs) <laughs> You're not wrong there. <laughs> um, so I'm pretty sure I understand the answer to this one. Uh, why is it that you want to kiss the Pope's ring? And do you think you'll ever have a chance to? Under the current Pope, no, because he's against it. But it is an older Catholic practice. And it is the showing the utmost sign of submission and respect to not only the church and the papacy, but to Christ himself, basically. So I would be more than honored to do that. It's just, it's an older way of showing respect, basically, mm-hmm. where you're kissing the ring of the Pope. Okay. And these usually the ring is something that's passed on from generation to generation. So if you're outside of the Catholic Church, it's a bit sketchy, but for a Catholic, we believe, you know, this goes back to St. Peter. So to be around something like that, of that old of that is nothing but like awe inspiring. So Ooh. going going back to you wanting to move to Montana, do you think that's where you're gonna get the best chance to hunt a grizzly bear or catch a mythical sturgeon? I don't know anything about <laughs> fish, so I don't even know if you can catch sturgeon in Montana. Sturgeons are only in the Great Lakes currently and in gotcha. some parts of Oregon, I believe, but they are very endangered and Oof. it's only permitted to have catch and release. So no, I wouldn't want to like cook and eat in sturgeon, but I would wouldn't mind, you know, being able to catch one because those are such beautiful species of fish and they are the closest things we have. 
I think they're actually older than crocodiles. Like, they're a very old species. Um, but, yeah, I would love to have an opportunity to that. Grizzly hunting, it's funny you mentioned it. At the end of this month, I'm actually going on a hunting trip to Alaska, so I'm really looking forward to that. Well, I hope you get your bear. Oh, yeah. Next time you see me, it's going to be with the camera <laughs> on, and I'm just going to be wearing a bear pelt that's covering my face. And then oh, you're yeah. like, okay, the camera's on. I can't see you, Solo. I'm like, you're not supposed to see me. I am the bear now. <laughs> I am one of nature. Uh, so what is the hottest authentic Indian curry? Does it have a name or is that just something that you want to do? Um, there is a name. I can't pronounce it. Let me pull it up. Let me try to pronounce it. Okay. <laughs> um, just be careful because I know. So there's this sound bite that I turned off my sound bites for this, but there's a sound bite of, um, do you know that emotional damage thing? Emotional damage. Yeah, see, I, I can't say that because it just makes me sound racist as fuck. <laughs> I mean, is it racist if it's funny? That's the question you gotta ask yourself. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, no, let me see. Where is this curry? Um, yeah, this thing has 7 million Scoville ratings, which, oh, if geez. you know what the Scoville scale is, yep. that's hotter than a scorpion Death pepper. It's called okay. It's <laughs> the chili pepper. Oh Christ! The chili pepper in this is called the bird eye in Naga, a very rare pepper that's only found in the hottest portions of India. Oh jeez. Pale um buk jolakia. So, oh, that basically means the bird eyes of Naga ghost pepper in English. But yeah, it's. Seem to be an unbearable heat that would make you question your sanity, is what someone put. <laughs> Jeez. That's fucking um, go. So my military and buddies and I, we were at airborne school. We were stuck in the barracks under quarantine because of COVID, and we were bored and we had money. You're like, let's spend this shit. So what did we all do? We bought the hottest peppers um, we could find. And like, you know, hot sauce. Mm -hmm. And we ended up getting a bunch of saltine chips is one in the morning and putting drops in them and seeing, you know, as guys would sing around each other, eating it and seeing who would last the longest about getting up for get water. Oh, jeez. We had one that I didn't know was an extract. Oh, extract fuck. To put like a <laughs> tiny little scoop in a giant bowl of chili. I put an extract on a saltine chip and we passed it around. I kid you not, Broshi. This was so hot, my teeth were physically hurting. Yeah, is it I do not know you can achieve a hot sauce where your teeth are hurting. Like, isn't it an like, extract just supposed to be used as an ingredient? Yeah, it was just pure potency. But me God. being the extra super smooth brain soldier <laughs> I was, I was like, yeah, let's go. You know, I only got a few more questions left, which is thank God because I'm getting kind of tired. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> Um, so, uh, something that I saw on your Twitter was, uh, no-fault divorces. What's your opinion on no-fault divorces? I'm strongly against it. I believe it's an ultimate spit in the face of the sanctity of marriage, but that's because I'm Catholic and we actually give a shit about marriage. Like, it's not simply a piece of paper signed by the government. It is... The ultimate sanctimony of holy re holy union between a man and a woman. And that's what... It's not something to be taken lightly. Like, I take Till Death Do His Part very serious. Like, And that's why I feel like people get mad and they're like, Oh, then more people won't get married. Good. If it means like I have quality over quantity in marriages, I want that in society. I want more stable relationships and marriages. I love that. But I understand that. Uh, as long as the, I don't know if you so there's these uh, viral clips going around right now of um I don't know what it stands for but it's this person named MLD and he's basically saying how uh if you even if you are getting abused in the relationship you're supposed to just endure the the, the abuse and stay married. And he is getting just raked up the coals with this comment right now. Um, yeah, run. no, I find that very disturbing. Like, 
Hold on. No full divorce means that there's nothing inherently wrong yeah. with either or a couple. And yeah, like a spouse beating his wife, I find to be morally apprehensible. And I feel like that should definitely be something that should be. So traditionally, if let's say you were in a Catholic relationship and you were a woman and then you were being beat by your husband, it was very common for the wife to go to um, a priest and tell him about these issues, whether that be through confession or do solid solitary confinement. And then the priest would have a friendly little chat with that gentleman. And let's just say they would not be hitting the woman anymore. <laughs> and yeah, because eternal damnation and hellfire sure does put the fear of God into people, especially young men. I think they're hot shit and they could beat women, but so what if the, they just end up falling out of love? Like they're madly in love, they end up getting married, and then, you know, years go down and they just kind of fall out of love. Do you still believe that they should just be able, just have to stay in that marriage even though they don't love each other anymore? Yes, I feel like they should go to marriage council and actually look into strengthening their relationships okay. and seeing where the spark died. I don't feel like quote unquote falling out of love is a valid excuse to divorce. I feel like if anything, that's just, just nothing more than a challenge in a relationship and a test to strengthen each other. Like some of the best relationships you see are not the ones where the couples have been lovey dovey since they're little kids. It's the ones that they have constantly trials, tribulations, pitfalls, ups and downs. Yet through all of that, they still stick with each other and they actually fight like one-on-one -on -one, like you know as a pair of each other instead of against each other mm -hmm. like i always see look at marriage like this when you argue if your spouse or significant other you're not arguing against them you're arguing for a problem you should center it as in you know i am not mad at you i am mad at this problem what can we both do as a team together to tackle this problem not me versus you i'm right you're wrong type mentality that's why I feel like if people did that more, that'd be a lot more productive. I definitely agree with that. That's actually something that Nicole has taught me throughout the years of us being together is it's like you said, it's not you versus me. It's us against the problem. And it, it, basically something that she uh, that really stuck in my head that she said is even though it might not be the easiest thing to do always, we have to actively choose like. I want to be with you. I will do anything I can to be with you. If there's something wrong in our relationship, like I said, it's not you versus me. It's us against whatever is wrong with our relationship. Amen to that. <laughs> um, do you... This also has been really fun. Um, sorry if it's off topic really quick. Would you be down to be on my podcast in the future? Gladly, dude. Fuck yeah, let's go, brother. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um... Do you think, uh, this one I did not find on your Twitter. It just came to my mind and I forgot to ask it earlier. Um, do you think that there should be stricter rules and regulations on the use of money in political campaigns? Yes, I do, because I want people to be able to have better representation by their community and not by a corporation. That's actually a really good answer. Well, yeah, I want yeah people. I want it to be by the people for the people, and not by the corporation for Amazon. Like <laughs> that's kind of like my view on that. All right, and then this is the last question I have. Unless you spark something during the answer, uh, what do you think is the best way to the resolve the wage disparity? Um, through. Let me think about that. Can you ask the question again? What do you think is the best way to resolve the wage disparity? So basically the wage gap um, that we constantly are hearing about, and basically how uh, the poor aren't given enough and the rich are given way too many or way too much. Um, other than just taxing the fuck out of the rich, do you have any other ideas on how we can fix this wage disparity between the three what's supposed to be three different classes 
I don't see the wage disparity as being an issue. I see that as just being a feature to what is capitalism. I would argue to let the markets be more freer and less government intervention and involvement. So it could give people more breathing room to be able to do things that they could more or less not be able to do under like strict government restrictions. So I always lead to the belief of a freer market to freer to people. And by doing so, I would feel like the wage disparity issue would be not absolved because I don't think, you know, it could ever be 100% absolved in a free mm-hmm. market because I don't believe everyone's 100% equal. But I feel like it could be lesser of a gap because more people have freer opportunities to do things of their own volition and will. So with that kind of system, though, how would you prevent monopolies from forming? My lap- <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Oh, good. I just got <laughs> monopolies only exist in the forming of a backing of a central bank so the only time we've seen historically going back to east indian trading company for example they only exist because a gov- government was backing them up and bailing them out so an example you could say amazon amazon time and time and time again that should have flopped numerous times because they bite off more than they chew mm-hmm. and then in a free market economy, they will be punished for doing stuff, leaving room for competitors to come up and do their thing. But what the government does is it has a bailout system for central banking saying, like, no, you're so pivotal to our economy, we can't let you collapse. Where an auction would say, that is absolutely ridiculous. You should let it collapse because that is a natural economy, and you'll have a better um, competitor come in to replace it. Okay. So I don't believe monopolies could exist in free market economies in that sense. Unless it's like a very niche field that only like one person does. So if you want to say like I make a ball with 18 purple dots on it. No one else makes this ball. Then you would say like sure that's technically a monopoly. But it's not in a sense of what people think monopoly is. So like specifically I would say that like Kleenex is a monopoly right now. Um, They're not called Kleenexes but... If you say Kleenex, everybody knows exactly what you're talking about. Um, I believe the actual term for it is a facial tissue. Uh, but nine times out of ten, I'm actually I should rephrase that. Ten, ten, ten out of ten times, I'm never asking someone, oh, do you have a facial tissue? It's always, do you have a Kleenex? My response to that would be that they are just good at advertisement and product recognition. Same with, like, the McDonald's lo- logo. Like, everyone knows what McDonald's is. That doesn't mean they have Monopoly on burgers. And for it to be Monopoly, it has to have, like, I think, last I checked, depending on what country you're in, the lowest estimate is, like, 60% market control, and the highest estimate is 80% market control. That's, like, Rockefeller era stuff and Vandermilt. But there's tons of better products, you could say, for Kleenex or facial washes. Like, you go to any beauty spa... They're not using Kleenex wipes to wipe, like, a woman's face. They're using, like, more bougie products, if you will, more better quality products. So Kleenex has just done good with marketing, and they're good with mass-producing a product that is cheap and efficient. But there are alternatives for more expensive, better quality things, so I don't think Kleenex is a monopoly in that sense. Okay. Yeah, and that is the absolute last question that I have for you. We have gone on, I mean... You know, I can, if we really want to, we can take over four minutes and have that exact three hours, but (laughs) I don't really feel a need to. (laughs) Um, But yeah, we went for just about three hours. Fucking thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Um, Hey, it was really fun. Um, Before we go really quick, did you ever have the chance to debate Bunk? Because I remember you said you'd be down Friday. Uh, not yet. Uh, I honestly haven't even been able to reach out to him. Um, what do you, what's the best way to reach out to him? Is it through Discord or is it through Twitter? Should be through Discord. He answers me fine. Oh, okay. um, unless he's messaging you, but that's just what it is. So I've messaged him once on Discord, haven't heard anything back, and then I think I've messaged him a few times on twitter he takes forever in a day to respond um 
but yeah, I I just really haven't gotten a chance to get him to respond to me. Are you going to hit him with the scorpion? Get over here, just yank him. <laughs> you know, I either that or I'm just going to have to start reacting to his uh, videos to the point where he eventually gets tired of me and is like, fine, I'll fucking debate you. Yo, let's fucking go. All right. <laughs> hey, I'll definitely give you a shout out. And even after this tournament, if you ever want to, what's it, hop on, debate anything or pitch me an idea, I'll try to find someone for you to get you more known. Yeah, it sounds good. But hey, I really appreciate your time. Yeah, thank no, dude. Thank you. Fucking, I'm hoping that this will. So I literally have a TikTok account that I haven't really been able to post any political stuff on. Um, an Instagram account that I haven't posted any political stuff on. YouTube, I have posted some stuff, but um, literally I had hired a editor, and then he said he was going through some stuff, so I understood. And then all of a sudden, he just never really got back to me about it. So I'm out of the YouTube algorithm to the point where I'm just kind of stacking up videos so that way then if something like this ever happens again I still have shit where I can send out sounds good um, but yeah I'll fucking I'll tag you on YouTube I will I don't know if you have a Instagram or TikTok or some shit but no you just find me on Discord Twitter and YouTube right now but I do have a sub stack I'm releasing soon and a podcast as well Thank you.